recording and proceedings will be conducted in accordance with the council's constitution including procedural rules which are available on the council's website the emergency evacuation procedure there is no planned evacuation drill this evening and accordingly if the fire alarm sounds it's treated as a genuine need to evacuate the emergency exits on your right for, on my right through the door and on my left past the elevators on the right i must remind you not to use the lifts when we get to the assembly point, which is down in the car park, please do not return to the building until I've said it's safe to do so. The meeting has a quasi judicial role and determines the rights and obligations of the applicant. Members must consider each application and anything, everything that is said in the meeting concerning the application and make their decision based solely on the planning judgment of the information available to them. Following the decision by members, delegated authority is given to the planning officer to issue the decision notice. Planning permission is not granted or refused until the issuing of that decision notice. Any member of the council who is not a member of the planning committee may attend as a visiting member and speak, having given prior notification. Such visiting members may include ward members. And whilst visiting members can speak on that application, they are not permitted to vote. Any member acting as a substitute on the planning committee must have undertaken appropriate training before doing so. Members must remain in the meeting for the whole time that each item is being debated and should not vote on that item unless they have done so. I'd now like to welcome our public speakers and remind you that you have three minutes to speak and an audible warning of time will be given, given when there are 30 seconds remaining. If the meeting is deferred to conduct a site meeting, you may speak both at this meeting and at the site meeting, but there will be no further opportunities to speak on the matter when it comes back to planning committee. Um, the, the, Meeting will follow the order set out on the public speaking list and then we'll return back to the remainder of the items. Uh, apologies for absence, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I have apologies from Councillor Gibson, who is substituted by Councillor Jackson. Apologies from Councillor Rolls, who is substituted by Councillor Whelan. Apologies from Councillor Beer and apologies from Councillor Simmons. But I noticed that. Councillor Cameron Bitt is remotely joining. Thank you. Um, I'd now like to invite members declarations of disclosable community interest under the Localism Act 2011. I'd now like to invite members non pecuniary interests under the Code of Conduct adopted by the Council. Um, I've won myself. Um, the, application, the applicant in 2 1 is known to myself, however, I'm not predetermined. And we'll take part in the item. I'd like to remind the meeting that where it's possible that a fair minded informed observer, having considered the facts, would conclude there was a real possibility that a member might be predetermined or biased on any agenda item, the member should declare this possibility and then leave the room whilst the item is considered. Item four to approve the minutes of the meeting held on the 8th of December 2022. Minutes number 507 to 501. Members agree that's a correct record? Thank you, members. We now move on to item five, which is the third item. And that is application 21 forward slash 505 722 forward slash out. And that's 128 High Street, Newington. Um, I'd like to invite the planning, planning officer to provide a summary update on the application, please. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, good evening, everyone. I will um, share my screen and then take you through my update. Well, actually, I've got a bit of a presentation. Um, members will note the tabled update and the amended report from Railton on behalf of Newington Parish Council. Um, this the application came to the November planning committee, so quite a lot of what's in my presentation will be uh, familiar to quite a few of you. Um, that's the plan showing the, showing the site location on the eastern edge of Newington Village. There's a aerial photo reinforcing that and showing um, it, it also shows the new persimmon development just to the north, which as members will be aware is, is now complete. Um, here are some photos, including the photo at top left, which is um, 128 High Street, Newington, which is going to be demolished to accommodate the access. 
to more photos of the site. But photos that show to photos of the frontage with the A2 um, and that that sort of one at the top so it shows where um, the access will be accommodated. More photos of the site, that one looking north across it. Existing block plan shows that there are some light buildings on the site, but largely it's free of development. Existing plan of the access that reinforces what I was saying about the, the fact that 128, which is half of a pair of semis, is going to be demolished. Um, Illustrative site layout, as members will be aware from the from the papers, this is an application in outline for up to 46 dwellings with all matters of detail aside from the access reserved for future consideration. So that's illustrative and that layout isn't for approval this evening. Um, there's a parameters plan, again showing sort of potential blocks of um, development in pink for illustrative purposes. Here's a plan specifically of the access. Um, as members will be aware from the papers and from the discussion at the last meeting. Access and in particular the visibility displays um, has proved to be um, a, quite a contentious a aspect of this scheme. Um, this is notably because the visibility display in a easterly direction, so coming towards um, Sittingbourne from the site in the rough direction of Sittingbourne slightly infringes third party land. Um, which which I'll sort of discuss a bit more in the, the context of the next slide. This is a slide that I slotted in this afternoon in in the light of correspondence from one of the ward councillors who um, who drew my attention to. Um, an application that was reasonably recently refused at 12 Keycore Hill. Um, as members may be aware, 12 Keycore Hill is just to the west of the Key Street roundabout, um, just sort of just the edge of bobbing, just um, to the west of the, um, the A249 and the sort of Sittingbourne settlement. Um, the, the reason for, for discussing this now is because um, just just to sort of emphasize the distinction between this application for for a new access, um, including visibility displays and um, and the app, the access that's proposed um, at at Newington. Um, in this case, the, the application was refused for for a number of grounds, and in particular, I note the following. In contrast to 128 High Street, the application was poorly presented with min minimal information to justify the proposal. The gradient of the proposed access was significant. You can see that in the photo I've provided, so that makes providing an access problematic. Lack of space within the site would have resulted in vehicles potentially reversing onto the A2, which is obviously something something that's going to be that's going to be difficult and. That that isn't something that the, the new access that, that Newington would um, would would result in. The development would be able to vehicles obviously be able to get in and out of the site in a forward gear. Um, the development the development at Keycole Hill would have re resulted in significant excavation um, to the detrimental of visual amenity. And with respect to visi visibility displays, um, relied on land partly and third party ownership to a potentially significant extent particularly in an easterly direction and involving land level changes. By contrast, at 120 at High Street, Newington, the issues with the access is limited, um, as, I, as I said before, to one of the visibility displays and is considered importantly by KCC Highways to be marginal. The officer at KCC Highways has, in current correspondence has commented, on, among other things, to say, when I looked at the visibility display, the amount that it crosses third party land is purely the thickness of the line drawn for the back of the display. So it's effectively following the highway boundary. So, so to be clear, both KCC highways and and our own highway, uh, our own. Instructed consultants that were instructed following the discussions in no November, that's the project center. Both consider that the. The, the arrangement at Newington, including the visibility displays is acceptable. 
Um, so moving back to the rest of the presentation, I've got these illustrative elevations, how showing sort of potential architecture for for the new development. I, I won't dwell on this, but because as I've been emphasising, this is this is illustrative, and it's and it's it. it I mean, it, whilst it it demonstrates something that's clearly to to quite a high standard, it isn't up for approval here. And and if this application is approved, there'd be a subsequent quits process, as members will be aware, where a reserve matters or multiple reserve matters applications would need to be made, and as part of those, that's when the council would pin down um, pin down the quality of development. Um, that's the end of my presentation. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Well, thank you very much. I'd now like to invite our public speakers. Um, first up is Councillor Stephen Harvey from Newington Parish Council. Good evening and hopefully you remember the key points on this one from November. It's about demolishing a semi detached house for the reason that it's the last house in the built up area of the village. Even the house next door, every application beyond that has been turned down by this committee and had been turned down at appeal um, because outside the built up area. The developer in this case has made no secret of their ambition to join this site up with Eden Meadow, where they had a previous application which they withdrew January 22, just before it came to committee. So though the access is within the built up area, please remember the proposed housing would be outside the built up area and in the countryside. The mitigation measures are cynical. The travel concession is almost worthless. It just in Chalkwell buses between Sittingbourne and Raynham. Community Orchard means little to people in Newington, centre of the Kent Fruit Belt. It'll impinge on houses in the traces and it'll turn a rural pedestrian, rural footpath into a pedestrian route. This would destroy our village, our ancient village. Remember, it's now a 20 mile an hour zone through the air quality management area. That's why we engage Mid Kent, um, University of Kent and Railton Consulting to look at those matters for us. Remember, please, also your own policies, ST3, your policy for no growth in Newington from this council two years ago, and all those planning inspectors' decisions. If you don't decide to refuse it tonight, then please carry out a site visit to see our very real concerns for yourselves. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to invite Mr. Wilford, please. Uh, good evening, members. Uh, my name is Andy Wilford. I'm head of land and planning at Esquire Developments. Uh, we are a multi award winning SME developer based in Kent. Most recently winning an Evening Standard Award for Best Boutique Development and the Watt House Award for Best SME House Builder in 2020. We're currently building a 30 dwelling scheme in Bobbin, which includes a nurse's accommodation for the Demelza Hospice, which was approved by this committee in December 2021. At the previous meeting in November, a considered debate was had by this committee in respect of the application and the request for an independent review of the suitability of the access onto the High Street. As requested, the independent review has been undertaken. The report was thorough and assessed not only the safety of the access and its immediate surrounds, but audited all other material that has been subject to this application, included the submitted transport statement, KCC Highways position, and the report prepared by the Parish Council, including the update item. The independent assessment concludes that the proposed access is safe and the impact on the network is acceptable, subject to conditions which we are of course agreeable to and is required through the detailed approval process in any event. We now trust this report adequately satisfies members' concerns in respect of the access. Members, we fully understand that development is an emotive issue and that this committee has to make difficult decisions. We believe that if members do need to make those difficult decisions, 
then the schemes that you are making those decisions on should be the best they can be and raise the standards for homes in Swale. This application has been thoughtfully brought forward with due regard to the existing form and character of Newington. Nearly half of the site is offered as open space in excess of one hectare and at least 80 metre of landscape buffer to the wider countryside. There is a net biodiversity gain of approximately 37%. The development will be fully electric with the use of air source heat pumps and a fabric first approach offering a greater sustainability credentials over and above building regulations. We are already achieving over 50% carbon reduction and more than happy to commit to this level by way of a condition. We are also encouraging alternative use of the private vehicle and working with the environmental health team in over providing air quality mitigation measures. We're providing a total of 18 affordable homes, which is policy compliant. And as an SME, our supply chain is local, meaning we support other local SMEs and businesses in the construction centre, all of us employing local people. The whole scheme will be of high quality design secured through reserve matters and delivered by an award winning SME house builder. It will substantially exceed open space requirements, net biodiversity requirements, and exceed carbon reduction requirements, all delivered in a sustainable location and crucially with a safe and acceptable access. We hope you're able to support officer's recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. Next up we have Melvin Harris, objector. Good evening. My name is Melvin Harris and I've lived in the traces for 36 years and tonight I'm speaking on behalf of residents who object to this application. I support what our councillors have said tonight and a previous uh, occasion and will not repeat any of those objections and will keep this short. The design and access statement contains some incorrect facts about our footage. It no longer has a restaurant and the non-peak train services are now only one an hour and not every 30 minutes. And this has been the case for about 10 years. The statement and the officer's report stress the key link of pedestrian access to the footpath in the traces and then to the footage amenities and transport links. However, there is an error on the plans as to where this link would be. Currently, it is shown as going through a paddock style fence and across land, both of which are owned by a local resident. The link to the footpath will need to be moved at least 35 metres to the south, somewhere presumably opposite Post House 38. The walk 35 metres south along one side of the fence, only to have to walk 35 metres back to the other side, may deter residents from using this route, particularly those on the south and east side of the defilement. And instead, they will opt to use the road onto the A2. Adults and children using that road will have to cross the A2 as there is no pavement on the south side of the A2 between numbers 100 and 80 High Street. We believe this major oversight miscalculation and the need to redraw the plans throws the whole application into doubt as this application is for access only. Local residents urge the committee if they still feel inclined to approve this application, then they should have a site visit before their final decision is made. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you for that. Um, I'd now like to invite the uh, wall member to speak. First, Councillor Palmer, please. I remind you, you have three minutes. Thank you, Chair. This committee asked for a third party report on the visibility displays to aid 
to aid you in your decision making process. What have you got? Project Centre seems to have the same concerns as the residents of Newington, of the residents, Newington Parish Council and Rotillion. Project Centre then suggests if permission is granted, then a condition is attached so that the developer reassesses the availability sprays to ensure confidence in the achievable sprays. It doesn't sound very proper and safe, does it? What happens if it's later found the visibility sprays do not meet the required standards because currently even the experts can't decide if they do? No, we are talking about highway safety on a major route, the A2 running through Newington. Project Centre further states we have concerns relating to retaining access to 132 the High Street. So there are serious concerns of highway safety. The, this application is not ready and incomplete on highway safety. The matter of highway safety hasn't been addressed by, by the applicant or project centre as requested by the committee. The third party land may be classed as just a pencil line on the map, but this third party land, which neither the highway authority or the applicant has any control over and should not be used to work out the form of the availability space. While the third party landowner may be prevented by planning law from building a fence over a metre high, you can't stop him from putting a caravan, a mobile home, a works vehicle, or even a 20 foot high hedge. And the, if the applicant cannot guarantee the visibility displays in perpetuity, then this application must be refused on grounds of highway safety. Retilian at para, at para 2 and 3 makes clear in their recent report highlighting concerns about the third party land which Swaleborough Council seems to have paid little or no attention to. This applicant should be should have carried out their own due diligence before putting in this planning application to assess visibility displays and third party land issues to ensure visibility displays in perpetuity. Without a, a legally enforceable and legally binding agreement in perpetuity with the third party landowner and any subsequent owner, such as an obligation by deed, then this application not, cannot provide the evidence of a sustainable and safe slaves in perpetuity as, re, as required. Condition 35 in the officer's report, um, in, in my view, is worthless and unenforceable. I cannot see how directing pedestrians around the village centre via the, the public right of way in Callaway Lane can, contributes to highway safety. This application does not offer any mitigation in terms of highway safety. The application must have a site visit because I think the highway safety is so critical. You will now hear from my ward colleague who is knowledgeable on highway safety issues from a previous occupation, Councillor Alan Horton, who will hi highlight further issues with speed, distance and visibility, space, et cetera. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Horton, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. I appeared before this committee back in November, and I am grateful that the committee deferred their judgment on the application so that they could obtain independent view regarding the issues we raised. I find it deeply concerning that when I read the independent advice provided by Project Centre, it reads as if the author recognises and shares the concerns of residents and the specific issues raised by Mr Bamber of Railton, and then recommends approval and adds the following recommendation, which I find unbelievable. They write, if the proposal is to be granted planning permission, we advise that a condition is attached requiring the visibility display to be reassessed using topographical data to ensure confidence in accuracy of the achievable displays. When would any responsible person in their right mind approve something as safe and only then look and check and see if it really was? This is very, there is a very easy way to be sure whether this is safe or not. Do the work properly and check first. And that is exactly what I think you should make sure they do. There are significant questions which remain unresolved. The visibility display is over third party land. That is an undisputed fact and one which on a number of other KCC decisions we found, we can demonstrate they have refused on that ground. The current or future third parties can and in Mr Bamber's opinion, are more likely than not extend their wall. And there is nothing, nothing at all to stop them getting a caravan or camper van tomorrow and parking it on that corner. Project Centre acknowledge that, and I quote again, the applicant's drawings are based on OS mapping, which does come with a degree of inaccuracy and does not accurately depict the existing wall at 132 High Street. 
and they also dismiss the implications and likelihood of a vehicle conflict at the junction during a parking manoeuvre, something that lacks an evidential base and that I find counterintuitive. I think that the suggestion the 20 mile an hour zone in some way mitigates the risk is a red herring. The zone starts 200 metres to the west of the proposed access and the visibility concerns are about the view to the east. I ask you to consider very carefully the details around the proposed junction. You may be quite confident you know this stretch of road, probably drive it quite often, but when did you last try and cross the road here or turn out of a driveway? I recommend that the planning committee refuse this application as it is clear the access is not properly thought through. It's based on iffy data and is over third party land which the applicant cannot control and you cannot make conditions to mitigate. If you retain any thoughts that this might be a sound application, then please conduct a site visit. Observe the driver behaviour and di difficulties of this access up close. Please be absolutely certain this is safe before you consider approval. Thank you, members. Thank you, Councillor Holtzing. Good timing. Um, I'd like to move the officer recommendation. Do I have a second, Dan? Thank you, Councillor Martin. I'd now like to open the debate. Councillor Winkless, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, can the officer, and I asked for a lot of these over the years on this committee, so you know what I think is coming. Um, you did show a picture of the A2 of the access, but have you got a clearer picture of the A2 as it would be where the access road <clears throat> is proposed, please? Yeah, uh, certainly. Yeah, this. Obviously, what I've been showing is a, a plan showing the proposed access and the visibility space. But um, amongst the photos that I went through, the one at the <clears throat> the one at the top um, shows is looking across the A2 straight at the access. So you can see the, the adjoining bits of the A2 um, sweeping away in in both directions. Put it on a plan as an alternative. You can sort of see it in the middle of um, just enlarge it. See it on the middle of that plan. And you can see where the red edge, the top of the application site, yeah. uh, meets, <coughs> meets the A2. Okay, thanks for that. As I think I did set the November meeting, I mean, I've used that road many times over the years. I have still got grave concerns that if this was passed tonight <clears throat> with the his ability of coming out on that road i don't know exactly what the up-to-date traffic count is now but i think it's probably about twenty-five thousand plus vehicles use that road a day very busy road especially in the mornings and evening when people are commuting between medway and city mall i would like to um propose a site meeting for members to visit that perhaps might not know the road perhaps quite as well as what some councillors might do in the city ball area. So I propose a, a site meeting, please. I've got a seconder. Thank you. Proposal. Do we have a seconder? Councillor Marchington, any discussion? Councillor Hunt, please. Thank you. Um, we spoke about a site meeting last time and decided against it. We, we were going to look at the the highway was was the concerns raised then, and we agreed that actually we don't have the knowledge to be able to just look at the traffic and suddenly become experts in in traffic. We've now got the um, response from the consultant on traffic, and I don't think going there to to look at anything is actually going to change anything. I think the other thing we need to think of is that we, this has been a couple of months now since we discussed this in November. We're now into January. If we start doing site visits and delaying this even further, we could start looking at non-determination. And I think if we keep delaying it and going through, that could be looked at on reasonableness as well. So just a consideration to think about. Thank you. Councillor Marchington, please. Do apologise. The um, where the proposed e e entrance and exit is to the east you, is the main junction going north, 
and there's there's a traffic island at that point and going and and there's a hatched area which you cannot enter when you're to separate the, the, the traffic lines which actually goes across the front of the entrance to this in the middle of the road where this site entrance is so to turn right you'd have to enter a hatched area which is already in in controlling traffic going towards the next junction up um is there plans in highways to alter the length of the hatched area or what, what are their plans to do that? That's what we need to know from, from KCC Highways before you could even think of turning right to that junction. And without that knowledge, you can't make any decision at all. Um, I'm I'm obviously not KCC Highways, which usually is a good thing, but, but it's a disadvantage when you're trying to talk about highways. Um, all, all I'd say is, as I, th I think the applicant alluded to in their in their presentation um in the event that planning permission is granted the scheme will obviously le need a detailed approval from kcc highways and that's that's potentially the stage they look at changing road markings if required i mean i think the other thing that, that i probably need to say generally is um you know, we've kind of we've we've got to this stage after kcc highways having multiple looks at the application um, and and concluding that the access is um, is appropriate and that the infringement of the third party land is is marginal and doesn't doesn't impact unacceptably on highway safety and also subsequently after members request quite rightly at the last meeting to to kind of corroborate what KCC highways we've had our independent consultants look at it very fair very carefully and and also reached the conclusion that the scheme is acceptable um and, and as, a, as a result of all that we've got the extra condition for the visibility displays which isn't because anyone thinks there's a there's likely to be a problem with what's proposed but but it's it but it's belt and braces so that it's looked at extra carefully um and also as set out in the report um i've kind of you know it's possibly not welcome to hear this we we do need to think very carefully about what might happen if if we were to decide to refuse the application we the planning committee were to make that decision and how we might fare at an appeal on the basis that we've got two sets of experts telling us the schemes acceptable i mean i appreciate that the parish accountants parish councils consultants are raising concerns but the count we've got two sets of experts KCC and um, Project Centre advising the council that there's there isn't a basis to refuse it. Thank you. I'll come, come back for a moment. Thank you, Chair. Um, but the, there's been no mention in any of these experts or highways about the hatched area in the centre of the road, which, is, which separates the traffic and it starts about 12 metres or more to the west of this junction. And so the road has already been split to move the traffic. So you either got either the and I can't see that they made it longer than you would have to legally do that you know, because it splits the traffic to, to enable traffic coming from the east to turn into that junction to turn north so that it can actually got a lane its own lane to stop in and then clear turn when it's clear to go. So a lot of thought went into that previous junction about the safety of this area and 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 this is now going to and have to try and cross that hatched area and no one's no one's even mentioned it. And that's so, but I am aware, and I'm sorry I have to say this, that uh, transport planning in this country, in the UK is the only business in the UK that can actually deliberately make something more dangerous. Thank you. If there's no further discussion on the site visit, I'll put it to a vote. All those in favour of site visit, please show. All those against? Okay, and abstentions? Yeah. Okay, that's the six for a site visit, seven against, and two abstentions. So that motion is lost. We are back to the substantive motion. Uh, Councillor Henderson, please. question of, uh, of safety a bit better. 
our transport expert has suggested and we have put in uh, condition 35 which says as part of approving it we should look again later at the visibility display can um, can mr wilson explain <coughs> why that order of action is a sensible one rather than looking at it first and making a decision afterwards thank you so i i i think the thinking behind it is that um you know whilst it's unlikely to throw up a insurmountable problem it's you know it gives an extra degree of comfort having the condition there i mean if 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 it if, if it was if it was considered likely that it was going to throw up an insurmountable problem then then i'd agree that it wouldn't be sensible to deal with it by condition it'd be sensible to deal with the issue at the at this stage before you make a decision but i mean to sort of the risk of sort of pushing my luck i mean i sort of refer you back to what i said before and the fact that what i mean i've i put quite a lot of weight on the fact that kcc highways have looked at this very carefully and they're happy with it i mean why why would it be in their interests to to put something forward that 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 wasn't going to be safe but for their own road network I mean, i don't I, I i can't see that they've got anything to gain by that Councillor martin uh, thank you, Chair. And I can certainly understand and empathise with where people are coming from on this, but I think we have to think very carefully and logically. 4.8 of the report on page 13 makes it very clear. We're discussing highways grounds again, and if we refuse on highways grounds, we will lose at appeal and we will probably be called unreasonable. We have two sets of experts out of three saying it's all right. We're stuck with it in that regard. We then discuss about hatch markings where well, that comes in when we start looking at the section 278 works from memory. Um, if you look at other developments around uh, the borough, uh, we're still waiting on 278 work approvals uh, for stuff that was approved in 2018 and 2019. It's not unusual for the detail on these to be left. If we're looking for reasons, to, we're not even allowed to say we're looking for reasons to refuse anymore. We have to look at what is the reason to approve. That is the way planning law is. This scheme as it stands, we don't have anything that we can say no on anymore. That's it. We fought the fight. It's not a fight you're going to win. So you have to accept sometimes where you get to. The five year balance, uh, the, the tilted balance is applying and actually the officers have come down on the right side of it, in my opinion. Thank you. Anyone else? Councillor Hunt, please. Thanks, Chair. Um, I'm not going to repeat a lot of that, but it, yeah, we need to move on from the traffic now. I think just one consideration, if we did look at refusing this on traffic grounds now and we go to appeal, who do we actually get to, to come in our side on? We've got our own consultant that's saying we should approve it and we've got KCC, so you've got nobody to actually argue the point for us at appeal. So um, I think both meetings that we've looked at this, everyone has just gone straight on to, to traffic and not considered anything else at all on this application. Um, I think that hopefully shows that there is no other concerns, otherwise it would have been raised at another point. Um, but we do need to, being realistic, we need to start approving some houses. Uh, we're not going to be getting anywhere. And if, if we start keep refusing developments, um, it's on there that out, outside of the, the local plan, but that that is going to be happening a lot more now. We're going to have to have sites um, that we necessarily really wouldn't want. And I think a site like this is a good one coming forward. And it is also good that we've got an SME builder coming in there that is as proven within the um, borough of having a good design. And whilst those designs that are coming forward are just indicative, I think that is the sort of thing that is going to be coming forward and that's the thing we should be pushing for. Um, and 
now the traffic is hopefully a side um, thing, we should be just looking at approving this and moving things forward. There's no further discussion. I'll take this to the vote. All those in favour, please show. All those against, please show. Extensions. So that's eight, four, five against and two abstentions. So permission is granted subject to conditions, section 106 agreement, uh, which has and with delegated authority to amend the word in the section 106. And that's issued subject to the issue of the decision notice. We're now going to move on to That's on item 2.2, reference number 22 forward slash 500601 forward slash full, and that is Radfield House and Farm, London Road, Tong, ME9, 9PS. And I'd now like to um, ask the officer for an update. <clears throat> Thank you, Chairman. Yeah, it's it's me again. Um, members will note the tabled update. I've also got a bit of a presentation. Um, this is the application site. It's um, at Tong between um, Ten and Babchild. The site is immediately to south of the London Road, but you'll notice that the access is taken from Dully Road via a, an existing farm track, which would be upgraded. Um, and then from Dully Road, you you connect you connect to the A2 that way. Um, and the advantage of that configuration is it avoids putting extra traffic onto a dangerous access right next to the site and instead takes advantage of an access onto the A2 that was relatively recently improved to to improve the visibility in an eastern um, easterly direction. <clears throat> um, there's an aerial photo of the site. There are some photos of the house. Um, one of the important things with this scheme, this is a this is a grade two listed um, former Weald and Hall house that's um, dates from 15th or maybe 14th century. The conservation office, office is on the call if anyone thinks that's critical. Um, what's important is to denote the sort of rather forlorn condition there finds itself in. Um, one of the advantages of this application is that it's, it will, um, as a result of the scheme, it's not what we call it formally call an enabling development, but but in, but in effect, approving the scheme will will allow as part of the development the the house to be restored and then converted into nine um, into two dwellings. Nine further dwellings are proposed um, behind the listed building. There's some photos of the access track. Um, that's just site behind the listed building and there's a reasonable that one oh um um the, the the good news on that front is that 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 plan is actually the same as the plan on the hun page 177 of your agenda I'm sorry that it's rather faint. It, um, if it's any consolation, it looks perfect on my laptop. No. I'm only, I'm only, I'm only kidding. Um, um, do you want me to zoom in now or? Sure. Sure. Please crack on. Um, I, was, I was going through the photos and I'd got uh, some, these are existing farm buildings that are kind of 
modern 20th century band would be removed, which which will, will benefit the setting of the listed building. <clears throat> and some more of them. Here's the proposed layout. I don't know how well that's, come, well that's coming out there. Um, but what you can, what you can hopefully see, I've zoomed it in a bit. Um, behind the listed building, it doesn't always work too well. Um, you can the listed buildings at the top of the screen, and then then further down is the proposed um, development in a sort of a, what we call a farmyard style. So it's to kind of create the vernacular of a historical sort of farmyard configuration and moving on through the through the plans there's some drawings of the um listed building which as i said is to be converted at those are existing elevations um the existing details of the, the farm buildings is they're, they're rather faint but as i say it's just those farm buildings that i showed the photos of um that's an existing building um, that's not listed, but is a non-heritage, um, non-designated heritage asset that be converted into another dwelling. Um, that's the listed building again, as I said, to be divided into two. These are some of the elevations of um, of, of the proposed dwellings, and as you'll say, you'll see it's um, it's seeking to sort of evoke a sort of traditional um, farmhouse configuration, farm, farm type configuration with the large, the large, the large roof form that you can, that you can see in some of those elevations. Um, and then there's some more elevations. Those are the floor plans. And that's it. Um, and the other, the other thing to say, as, as I mentioned, the conservation officers on the call, so if, Members need more information about the listed building or or about how the um, how the proposals evolved in terms of the setting of the listed building, then I'm sure he'd be able to provide that. Thank you, Jim. I'd like to invite the conservation officer in now, as I'm sure we'd all like to hear from him. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I can confirm that the, this this um, this application has been a, been a long time um, in the in the pipeline, um, and it's followed on from um, <clears throat> uh, some pre-application discussions, which in in turn sort of followed on from um, the um, the at-risk nature of the building being highlighted in our heritage strategy. So um, that's going back several years now, um, and the applicants kind of worked quite patiently with officers to develop the scheme, um, including a number of site visits and, and looking carefully at the the building, um, the listed building and its condition. They they have undertaken some um, some repairs to to make the building watertight in terms of roof um, roof um, roof works, but uh, the other aspects of the building are in quite poor condition. And you'll notice from the photographs that um, uh, Mr. Wilson was showing you that the um, the windows are boarded up. Some of the windows have been, some of the interior frames have been lost, and the interior condition of the building is quite quite poor. But um, the actual plan form of the building is still largely intact, and the proposals to convert it into two two units um, work um, quite well in in, in sort of um, unison with the with the plan form of the building and managed to um, avoid significant alteration. Um, in particular, the sort of division, the internal division to make the two units um, avoid any sort of significant um, intervention. Um, and you'll still perceive the the um, the former farmhouse as a single unit as you see it from um, from the road and from the sort of track running down the side of the house. Um, <clears throat> So it's making use of existing openings to to achieve the um, the two separate access points into the uh, into the building, um, and it will be restoring. Um, if you can see in the middle photograph that's currently being displayed, there was a there was a sort of offshoot um, in the sort of conservatory form um, where that sort of white tr triangular aspect is next to the chimney. That's being 
that's an aspect of the building that's going to be restated as part of the proposals. Um, so I think the building, uh, sorry, I think the proposal is is quite a good one in terms of um, bringing the uh, the listed building back into use in a sensitive way. Um, and in terms of the the new build, um, we've we've looked very closely at the historic um, building um, pattern for the the former farmstead, and I don't think we've got a slide showing the um, the former. Um, the former layout of that, but I can share my screen if members are interested to show you what that looks like. But what you see now is is very um, reminiscent of the of the sort of um, the footprint um, layout of the of the barns that historically stood on the site before they were um, demolished and the and the sort of modern at cost barns were um, were erected. Um, <clears throat> so. It's quite a sort of um, well thought out um, sensitive scheme um, and it's um, deemed to be one that will certainly improve the setting of the listed building um, and also um, provide um, some valuable homes. So um, I think that's probably about as much as I can usefully say at this point, but I'll happy, happily jump in again if anybody's got any particular questions. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Mr Algar. Um, I'd now like to ask the objector if she wants to speak on this item. Obviously, we've got two items, this, this full application and listed building, building consent. On my paperwork, I've got you registered for the second item, but I was wondering if you'd prefer to speak now rather than on that item. If you're there, Sarah Barley. I am, I am there. Thank you very much. Um, yes, I'll speak now if that's all right. Um, OK. Uh, well, we live, if you look at your first map, we actually live on the uh, little bit of greenery on the other side of Dully Road. So this is an area which is um, dear to our hearts, actually. This is where uh, uh, we walk our dog and enjoy um, the beautiful area that, that we have been living in for the last nine years. Um, and uh, 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 we feel, well, I shall read out what I, what, what I wrote. So we object to this planning application on the following grounds. Firstly, it involves substantial changes to a very important historical building noted in a local history publication as being one of the six most significant buildings in the whole area of Sittingbourne. We've all watched, as we've driven past the A2, this beautiful house fall into an almost unrecoverable disrepair over the last number of years. It has always perplexed us as to why this has been allowed to happen by the owner, who, we are informed, is one of the richest people in Kent. The motivation for this vandalism can only be speculated upon. This house needs saving and returning to a thing of great beauty for generations that come to enjoy it, and not merely becoming yet another part of another developer's housing estate. It is up to the council to protect the heritage for future generations. Our second main objection is that this development falls within a designated country area and would completely change the nature of the immediate environment, as well as the fact that building a number of new houses, hmm, perhaps they look pretty, I don't really see, within the footprint of, and setting of this potentially beautiful listed building will completely ruin its integrity. Our third and final objection is that the proposed new road linking the development to Dully Road would negatively impact Dully Road, a designated rural lane, policy DM 26, and bring extra traffic, noise and pollution. And it might be worth uh, saying that as the traffic comes out of Dully Road, uh, 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 out of this new proposed uh, road and onto Dully Road, you would have a short turn to the right, and then, of course, you are facing the A2. Um, uh, someone mentioned the fact that this this exchange and interchange um, has been widened. Well, hmm, not not that I've noticed in the last eight years. It's actually quite a dangerous little lane to get out of, and of course, at the moment, that is a. Uh, a 60 mile an hour limit uh, to A2, which uh, would be a good idea to change anyway. Um, OK, so this is a rural lane um, and also. Um, up, I'm afraid. 
Thank you. Okay. Just about to say that uh, we applied. Yeah, uh, time's uh, up. Sorry. Right. Um, I'd like to invite the agent in, please, Alistair Hume. Hume. Good evening. Um, having regard to what you've heard um, in the presentations, both by officers uh, and the objector there, I, I, I think um, the following is relevant to your assessment of whether you uh, perceive this to be positive change. Uh, I think the first point that I'd make is this is a single comprehensive application, which is made up of two interlinked components, really. Firstly, the restoration, as we've heard of the great two listed uh, property, which I think actually dates back to the 15th century, uh, according to our um, heritage specialist, and occupies a prominent position, as we've heard, on the London Road. Um, and it's also identified in the at-risk register. The building's vacant, and it's relevant that restoring the building to its former glory extends beyond just the, the structural um, external fabric and internal fabric. There's a comprehensive, well, there's extensive curtilage, walling, um, Rail, um, railing as well, um, to, to, uh, and the grounds being sort of improved uh, alongside that. So, a very costly um, um, to put back to its glory. Um, but I think it's agreed by all parties uh, that the re residential restoration of Redford House is positive, uh, and in heritage and planning terms, I, I think that's recognised in the specific uh, response of the parish council on that. The second integral component of the application, and this uh, addresses some of the um, objectors' comments uh, as well, is the replacement of what are modern large concrete frame storage buildings and the conversion of a single storage building at the wheel of a more traditional scale. The more modern buildings are of considerable footprint and height and are sited close to the back of Radfield House. And alongside the expanse of hard standing uh, beyond, are agreed to detract from the setting of the main listed house. So as a result of these factors, the applicant's team felt that there was a real opportunity through the redevelopment and conversion of the rear portion of the site to improve the setting of Radfield House. And this would generate the funds needed for the, the goal of, of uh, restoration of Radfield House itself. So the application, as we've heard from the conservation um, uh, architect, um, took a lot of work through pre-application engagement with the, um, the heritage and officer team. It's relevant also that uh, there was pre-application discussion with KCC Highways as well, um, which addressed and, and, and that there's no technical uh, objection to the proposal and, and the access. Um, during those extensive discussions, there, there was um, quite a lot of detail, as we've heard uh, again, and, and a number of additional reports and design changes were agreed. So to, to summarise, really, um, I think the, the revised scheme beyond Radfield House itself has been designed as a farmstead based on a more traditional farm layout. Thank you. It, Your time is up. Thank you. I'd now like to move the offer for recommendation. Do I have a seconder, please? Thank you, Councillor Martin. I'd now like to open the debate. Councillor Winchers, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I am totally behind uh, the proposals with this one. Um, yet again, I've driven by this building many times, only about a week or so ago. It's technically a listed building, but um, the state it's in at the moment, it's a, in my opinion, it's just a total eyesore. And I think the proposals to enhance this, this listed building and the associated um, uh, development around it, um, in my opinion, is a good proposal and I will be back in this uh, application. Thank you. Councillor Henderson, please. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr Chairman. My, my inclination certainly is to um, support this. Uh, I, I've driven past the... Um, uh, I'm sorry, my name, Radfield House, um, certainly many hundreds of times. And over the years, 
my heart sinks a little bit further each time because it's uh, it, it's gone from being in okay condition to being in really appalling condition. I, I do have a, a couple of questions and uh, would then probably like to make a a small uh, amendment to the uh, proposal. Um, Page 147, I didn't quite understand why the Environment Agency um, said that it falls outside our remit um, in terms of uh, the various bits and pieces there. Uh, I, I wonder if somebody can tell me why that's so. Secondly, there's a section which I'm frantically looking for. Sorry, I'll be with you. Uh, on page 150 of all the various KCC development contributions, um, the the education ones uh, seem okay, but uh, again, my question is the the various other ones for community learning, youth service, and so on are tiny contributions, uh, and I, I wonder if the officer can say why they are so small, and then thirdly on page one hundred and seventy two. Condition 20, uh, I'd like to ask for an amendment there because it does not include what we have always insisted on including, that the soft landscaping should be of all of native species and to seek to improve ecology and biodiversity. Uh, that's a standard uh, that that we agreed years ago, uh, and yet again it's been missed out. They they've only talked about native trees uh, and not um, native species for the rest of the soft landscaping. So um, I, I'd like an answer, if I may, to my two questions and. Uh, I, I propose that small amendment to condition 20 and will then uh, support the application. Thank you. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, so any consultee response that comes in from KCC in respect of developer contributions is founded in the commissioning plans that KCC undertake as the statutory body for the relevant service. So KCC are the statutory authority for social care, for example, for libraries, for highways, for education. And all of those individual departments will assess the projected growth through the local plan process, windfalls, population growth, and they will estimate increases in population. They will then look at what needs will arise for all the different services, and they will then put a plan together that commissions those services over a period of time. And that plan then also assesses the cost of the provision of those services at the date that that is secured or the date that that is put into the plan. And then they work out a per dwelling sum from that. So they do some maths 
say, you know, we're expecting to to see a thousand dwellings. The cost is sixteen thousand pounds, so therefore it's it's sixteen pounds per dwelling. So that's what they do. They assess the individual per dwelling cost for the provision of the service in that particular area for the particular project that they have identified that will arise as, as something to meet that that development impact. And then they will request that through the contribution. Each of those contributions is always identified as being index linked. So the cost is assessed at date A. If it's delivered at date B, the difference in the cost of delivering it at point B will be factored into the amount of the contribution. So although it states, for example, £16.42 per dwelling for the community learning figure, by the time that is actually paid over to the council, it will be index linked and taken forward to a, a slightly increased value so that the build costs, et cetera, can still be met. And of course, there will also then be provisions in terms of interest if payments are late, and that will be added on top as well. So hopefully that answers the question. If I may, Mr Chairman, that's a very full answer and I thank you for it, but it doesn't answer the point I was making is why have KCC set those figures so low? It, it, it doesn't show any idea of improving those services in the Swale area. That's obviously for, for KCC because it's their response and um, that's what they've asked for. They will ask for what they believe the cost of providing those services to be to them. And that's that's their statutory um, function. They can't ask for more than they need because, again, much like planning conditions, obligations, Section 106 obligations have to meet tests of being necessary, directly linked, etc. So we can't ask the earth it would be lovely if we could it would be lovely if we got it but we can only go with what is reasonable and if KCC have assessed the cost of something as being what it is and that generates a per dwelling figure that's what we get asked for um, looking at the figures on the table those are very very standard figures I, I've been spent most of the afternoon drafting a section 106 agreement for Swan Street Avenue which is on the agenda this evening and the, the figures are very very similar giving rise to the same sorts of needs. OK. Uh, Mr Wilson, any comment on the uh, proposal? Or advice? Mm. Um, normally we have three landscaping conditions. One saying you submit landscaping details before you commence. Another one saying when you implement the landscape. And then condition 21 saying any landscaping that dies and replace. But as far as I can tell, the first two of those seem to be absent. So um, thanks for highlighting that. Um, we also need delegation to add those other two landscape conditions and this, which are quite standard. And I apologize for the fact that they I'll include that in my amendment, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Marston will second. Is there any discussion on this? All those in favour, please show of the amendment. So that's unanimous. We can now go back to the uh, substantive motion and Councillor Martin, please. Yep, I'll keep it nice and brief. Uh, I don't think there's anything to dislike particularly here. This is clearly well thought out. Um, I think we've all driven past this particular dwelling many times. Every time I go past it, I sit and think that's probably our biggest empty dwelling in Swale. Um, and how long has it been sitting there empty? How long has it been on our empty dwelling list? Let's get it up and in, in, into use. It's a lovely, it could be a lovely building to go past rather than as has been described in eyesore. Um, I think the, uh, we can't call it enabling development, but it is really, isn't it, behind, uh, does arc back to how um, farmsteads and farmyards were set up. Uh, it reminds me of some of the rural uh, farm areas around Faversham that uh, have been done similarly with barn conversions. So I think it's a very uh, good scheme and uh, full play, uh, fair play to the officers uh, for taking as long with the applicant developing a pre-app uh, that, that makes sense as they have. Councillor Bonnie, please. 
Thank you. I think um, our heritage officer's ears are bleeding from the number of times I've spoken to him about what on earth is going on with this building. It's in such a despicable state um, that it's not being cared for. And to watch the conservatory on the side collapse and the windows um, disintegrate. Um, a question I'd like answered first before I make all my points. Could the officer um, set out what the plan is for the walled garden? <clears throat> that sounds like a question for Mr. Algar. If that's that's fine, that's okay. fine, Jim. I can answer that one. <clears throat> yes, the I mean, the basically the um, the walled garden will provide a substantive garden for one of the units, and um, so it will effectively be a sort of private amenity space for <clears throat> for the unit on the west side of the building, um, and there will be a requirement for the uh, for the wall uh, the the wall enclosing the space to be um, to be repaired um, as necessary as part of that. We, we've got a condition requiring um, schedule of works to be submitted and agreed and the um, the applicant is aware that um, we'll be expecting some some repairs to that wall as well as to the um, the frontage railings which are listed specifically in the in the um, list description and, and also require um, some some intervention so um i mean the detail I, I don't think we've got a sort of detailed design for the um for the actual kind of landscape within the within the wall garden but um i don't think it's is is there's any sort of historic um particular pattern of development there that needs to be retained so i think it would just be an informal kind of kind of grass space that um you know assuming probably a family will Will, will occupy the unit and can can enjoy it. So um, hopefully that answers your question. Been in the garden, but I do recall it had some quite nice plants that you could see. There are some trees, I think, but I don't think there's any sort of formal pattern of development as such to, um, that um, we need to. Um, I mean, we, we are um, potentially looking into the history of the, the garden space um, as a part of a separate project, but that's um, that's a separate matter. Um, obviously, if we find anything, then that can be sort of factored into factored into the landscape design. Right. Thank you for that. That's helpful um, <clears throat> and constructive. So I do welcome the fact that this house will finally uh, be put into good order if this is approved and that the really ugly agricultural barn that is immediately behind it would disappear. I think that is a huge benefit. I do have some concerns, however. Um, I happened to drive along Dully Road this morning trying to get my way to Canterbury. Um, it is an extremely narrow road. I'm surprised about KCC kind of supporting bollards because we have tried to get bollards installed on a public road before um, and they've absolutely denied that um, on health and safety grounds. Uh, I think that was the case because there was an accident in Ashford um, and they have almost an embargo on bollards. So I find it surprising that this development would therefore have them. My concern is, knowing this stretch um, quite well, is any road that goes to the A2 is a cut through. And that is a case in point because of the road, uh, the junction five closures and upgrade, is it's game on for anywhere to get along there because of the congestion. Um, so any sort of public access where people think they can escape off the A2 when that is regularly jammed along the A2 there. And this stretch where the junction of Dully Road is, there's been a, at least two fatalities at that junction. One of them was a motorcyclist. Um, it is extremely dangerous there because people don't realise they're coming into Bapchild and where the 30 mile an hour drop down is, um, they come in at breakneck speed just around Hempstead House um, uh, Hotel and that junction with Dully Road and there is regularly crashes there. Um, so I have grave concern about putting more traffic that would come through Dully Road onto the A2 there. And that's the very reason um, they've put this side access in because the A2 is dangerous there. So I'd really like to properly understand 
how there is going to be restrictive access for residents only, I'd have thought an electronic gate system would have been better than bollards, given KCC's stance on bollards. Um, because we're going to have to send our refuse trucks up there, we're going to have to send fire trucks up there. Um, this is a proper, you know, uh, safety concern. Um, I'd also like to understand, given all the aggravation we've had with Stones Farm and the development there and all the mud on the highway and wheel washing, that we have some really decent conditions in there that are properly enforceable, that any construction traffic, its route, is it coming directly off the A2 or are we going to send all the construction traffic down onto the narrow Dully Road, which is a... Uh, protected green lane, which will erode the banks of the uh, the country road. Um, so if we could have an explanation of that, because we need some really strict wheel washing ones. We've seen an utter mess on the A2. I also note that the doctor's surgery no longer exists in Tenham. So anyone who wants to access any public health um, uh, facilities will have to go into Sittingbourne. And this is obviously too small that we don't get a single penny contribution and neither did we for Stones Farm. Um, so this side has really suffered with that lack of infrastructure and investment. So if we could have a perhaps a, a review on, of that. Condition five um, covers the uh, provision of wheel washing, but obviously we want to make sure that officers. Um, specific direction on that well they can as um as the chairman says um the, as well as wheel washing that in condition five condition five also includes um routing of the construction traffic um but but that would be a matter where we consult KCC highways i mean the applicant would make us or their agents would make a submission saying this is what we propose we propose propose and KCC highways would say yes that's fine or no, we're concerned about the lorries coming along and X, Y, and Z route. Um, so that's how that would be dealt with. Um, do you want me to answer the other part before? Yep. Before, and then I'll come back on that. Potential <laughs> critique of it. Um, in terms of the bollards, I mean, the bollards aren't, are, they're within the development. So it's a slightly different situation from the bollards being on a, on a public road. They're, they're on the, they'll be on a private road and and in terms of the location I don't, don't know how they're they're shown on that plan they're, they're quite quite hard to see I'll just try and zoom in there's there's two lots of them one at the top of towards the top of the screen hopefully you can see where there's a the little bit of yellow and you can see where a bollard's indicated and then <clears throat> so that's to stop traffic turning because of the, the, the access from the A2 you you this the existing track and you t you turn in and that bollard would stop people turning into that track getting into the housing development and then further down that existing track at the southeastern corner and there's another bollard proposed so that all the people coming directly from, all people get coming directly from the a2 can only get to the three existing houses alongside that track and to the other the other uses that, that are they're already in place. Everyone coming to the development will need to come from Dully Road, which, as we discussed at the beginning, has has an access. Um, well, there's a long there's the long access track, and then Dully Road joins the A2 several hundred meters further towards Sittingbourne. Um, <clears throat> so that's so that's what's proposed. I mean, the other thing to say is you'll notice in the table update um, we're seeking delegation for an extra condition. One to pin down the details of retractable bollards. So that's like the, the specification to make sure it's a suitable specification. Two to pin down when the bollards are provided so that they're in place before any of the houses are occupied. And three to ensure that the bollards are rain, maintained in perpetuity. Um, <clears throat> so that's that's where we are with those points. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Or allowing the officer to answer that. And um, so, in terms of the bollards, the the one that's off Dully Lane, if I can suggest 
that actually it's not so close to the road that you can actually pull off the road because I'm thinking if you've got couriers regularly visiting these properties and they're queued up on Dully Lane effectively you're going to have standing traffic on a country lane so uh, what that's the positioning of these is absolutely critical as to how that functions and the disruption it causes to the rural lane um, not only the traffic coming and going but the traffic trying to get in if there is a restriction so you know is bollards the right thing or is it better to have an electronic gate set off the road so it's a car or van length that someone can safely pull off whilst they buzzer uh, a resident sorry just to um the, the the bollards aren't aren't at the dully road in there they're right next to the development so there isn't an issue with um vehicles getting off the dully road onto the access track that that's that's the way we're expecting cars to come and the, the bollards aren't expect aren't to impede impede people um coming coming to the development from dully road they're to stop people coming directly from the a2 next to the development okay right well that sorts that out um so in terms of construction traffic i think the preference um, from a local point of view is it goes straight off the A2 and onto onto the site rather than dragging it down the country lanes and affecting impacting the country lanes um, and I do think we should have a say on that uh, as local ward members. Councillor Davey please. Uh, thank you chair. Um, I, I have a lot of sympathy with uh, Sarah's piece because I thought um, listed buildings had to be maintained and there was enforcement if people allowed them to fall into disrepair to such an extent that they either collapse or they have to be propped up somehow. Although it's good to see that the buildings come back into use. Um, with reference to the repairing of the wall, I'm assuming, uh, Simon, that they will be using like for like materials uh, to match in with the um, original build. And following on from uh, Councillor Bonney's uh, point about uh, routing traffic, it's all well and good having the uh, the traffic plans in place, but enforcing them seems to be another issue. As uh, Councillor Hunt uh, will know about the Red Row Estate and uh, the number of lorries that I've seen going uh, above, and Councillor Winkless has seen going down Laxton Way and Windmill Road because they'd follow their sat nav. So um, I would hope there's some teeth in that enforcement and uh, with reference to the 106s on page 150 under youth services um kcc are, are citing um funds for the existing youth facilities including the new house sports and youth center i thought that had been abandoned by kcc um and it was no longer being used and all the youth facilities have been moved elsewhere. I know it's nothing much to do with us, but it's just, a, I thought, a point worth raising. Thank you, Chair. Chair, so if I could perhaps cover that first point, and I think Mr. Wilson can probably cover the second, second two points, if that's OK. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, um, so in relation to the wall, um, yes, um, there'll be, a, there'll, there'll definitely be an expectation and a related requirement, <coughs> excuse me, through the um, schedule of works planning condition that um, any repair works to the wall will be carried out using um, matching brickwork and um, line, line based um, mortar for repointing and any um, new pointing that's required. Um, we can make sure we've got sufficient detail in the details that come through to us to make sure that's suitably sensitive and retains the, uh, the special interest and character of the wall. Um, and also, I think I mentioned to you earlier that there'll, there's a, there'll be a requirement for um, repairs and refurbishment, refurbishment of the metal railings as well. OK, I think that's all I can say on that. Thank you. Um, just well, starting with the youth services point. I mean, if we can we we can deal with that as part if this is approved as part of negotiating the section 106 agreement to make sure that the money goes to a project that's still relevant in stroke and existence. 
Sorry, what was the third question? I've just temporarily escaped my mind. The, the other. <clears throat> oh, OK. Um, yeah, that's I mean, that's kind of kind of for, for, for another day in the you know, we, we've got a condition that we think is appropriately worded and it's, you know, it's, you know, if, if and when there are complaints, then. Then it's obviously going to be for whale to investigate them and, and engage with. KCC highways as as required to make sure they're complied with, but yeah, that we can't. We, we you sort we can't guarantee how that will happen. So sat in this room dealing with this application. Councillor Hall, please. Thank you. Um, I'd just like to say that it'd be nice to have heard from the ward councillors, haven't they? Showed this evening. Councillor Hunt, please. Thanks, Chair. I'll just comment on the access. I think it got a little bit confusing there about what's what's going where and with the bollards and things. Um, but I I think it is it's completely clear on here, and I think every aspect of this application is better than than what there currently is with with the access, the, the house itself, and what's at the back with the, the barns at the moment. Um, I think just taking note of what is in the report where KCC have raised concern about the safety on the A2, and that's particularly why the bollards are in place um, to stop traffic. But if there is a concern with with um, traffic coming into to Dunny Road and getting access, I think mean, you do just need to consider that at the moment traffic can come out of that development. It could it could be used as a farm um with tractors and lorries going in and out and coming out of there straight onto the a2 but that safety concern is raised and recognized by kcc and having it come in the other other route by dully road is an improvement and i think it's the best scenario that there is um and i can't see any problem with that access and i, I think that that will probably be even be better as well with the um, traffic routing because otherwise you're going to have lorries pulling out there onto the A2. Um, so I, I can't see any problem with it at all. Okay, we're now moving to the vote. All those in favour, please show. This is for the planning application with amendments and conditions. All those against? Extensions? So that is approved by 14-4 and one abstention. Um, Supply permission is granted subject to conditions, amendments and delegation of conditions. And yeah. So we now move on to 2.3. And that's application number 22 forward slash 505 602 forward slash L. BC, and that's Redfield House and Farm, London Road, Tong. Is there any further update? Um, thank you, Chairman. Just to say there, there is a short tabled update which members will have seen. Um, I won't go through the update, uh, sorry, through the presentation on the basis that, that it would have just been the slides just for the listed building, as this is an application for the listed building works to facilitate um, the conversion of the listed building into two dwellings. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Um, does the agent wish, still wish to speak on this? Thank you. No ward members, so we. I'm, I'd like to move the officer's recommendation. Do I have a seconder, please? Thank you, Councillor Martin, for your speedy response. Um, I'd like to open the debate. In which case, we move to the vote. All those in favour, please show. So that's 14 4 and one abstention slash absence. Um, so on that one, permission is granted subject to the issue of the decision notice and conditions. As we've now all been seated for an hour and a half, I think we should take a short break. We'll all be back in uh, 35 minutes past eight, please.
So next item is 2.4. So reference number 22 forward slash 505 172 forward slash full and that's 11 Dane Close, Hartlip Ken, ME970 N. Is there any update on this one, please? Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Um, no update for members. Um, I'll just give a brief presentation um, of the application. Okay, so um, the site is 11 Dane Close, which is within the built confines of Hartlip. Um, and Dane Close is essentially a cul-de-sac. And as you can see, number 11 sits at the um, at the end of the cul-de-sac um, in a horseshoe arrangement with, with other dwellings. Again, that's an aerial photograph showing the, the arrangement. And that's the application property there with the beige garage door. And again, with neighboring properties as well in the picture. Uh, the application is for a front extension oh, go on for front extension to the property um, which um, essentially extends the garage here and the main entrance and it also includes a small roof overhang to uh, where these pillars are here you see that again here in the floor plan and in elevation form here um, so there's a uh, essentially a dummy pitch on the roof and a flat section behind it that connects to the, the main house. As you can see here, you've got a little roof overhang, the pillars, pitch roof and the flat section here. Um, Dane Close is um, a spacious uh, layout character, uh, detached dwellings with reasonable gaps between each other on large plots and with uh, large open frontages, as you can see from the photographs. Um, this application is for a modest front extension to the property, which the uh, which officers consider uh, maintains the um, the open spacious character um, of the street um, and officers consider it's acceptable in terms of its impact on the street scene and character. Uh, in terms of impact on neighbours, if I just go to the site plan, um, you can see that the extension does not project beyond this neighbouring property here. Um, so we have no concerns about the relationship with that property. This property here, um, it has a living room window in this front elevation, but given the distance to the extension and the angle, um, we are um, perfectly satisfied that, that there's no harmful impact that would arise there. Uh, so our recommendation is for approval. Thank you. Thank you. I'd now like to invite Claire Lander, the agent, to speak, please. Chairman and councillors, thank you for the opportunity to speak on this application. Um, I'd firstly like to highlight that the planning officer has recommended approval and has identified that there are no planning reasons why the application should be refused. The planning officer states that the development would be acceptable in terms of the street scene and in relation to neighbours amenities. In terms of the need for the proposed front extension, uh, internal photographs of the garage with a car parked in have been submitted, which demonstrate how extremely tight the space is uh, when a car is in the garage. Um, the car only just fits in with certainly not enough space to walk around it. Um, it is well known that cars have increased considerably in size since the house and the garage were built. Uh, the proposed front extension will enable sufficient circulation space around the car and a more usable garage space. In terms of the relevant planning policy, the designing and extension SPG is considerably outdated being from 1993 and should not be relied upon as an indicator for any prescribed limit to the depth of front extensions. The Swale LDF panel has acknowledged that this SPG is outdated. It should be given minimal weight. Instead, the proposal should be assessed against, in particular, the more up-to-date local plan policy DM16. In response to this policy, the proposal is of an appropriate design and scale and the street scene and residential amenities will be maintained. 
the proposal is a modest extension which is appropriate in terms of its site context. The neighbour and parish council objections are noted. However, in response to these, there is no prescribed building line that must be adhered to with a number of, a number of properties having front projections. And front projections to houses are in fact characteristic of this part of Dane Close, as shown in the many photographs submitted to the council. Front extension to the house will not therefore appear out of place, but as an expected feature in the locality. 11 Dane Close occupies a corner plot and sits behind the neighbouring building line to 12 Dane Close. Any future applications at other properties would be assessed on their individual merits. It is therefore respectfully requested that members support the application. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now like to move the officer recommendation. Do I have a seconder, please? Thank you, Councillor Martin. I'd now like to open debate. Any discussion on this? Excellent. We move to the vote. All those in favour, please show. So that is unanimous. So that's granted subject to conditions and issuing a decision notice. We move on to 3.1, please. And the reference number is 22 forward slash 504 256 forward slash full, and that's 6 Elmway, East Church, Ken, ME12 for JP. And is there an update on this one? Uh, thanks, Chairman. Um, there is an update which I've incorporated into um, my short presentation. Um, this is um, an this is an application for a new building um, which would be a residential bungalow um, at number six Elm Way, which you can see identified there um, in red. Um, the site is located to the north of East Church and immediately to the north of the designated holiday complex. Um, which boundaries of which run immediately around the site here, along here and along here. So in terms of um, for planning purposes, the um, site is within the countryside. And um, that's an aerial photograph of the site um, prior to the development taking place. This is here is actually a former building that's on site that has um, in part now been replaced by uh, the development that is subject to this this application. And this plan um, just highlights to members uh, the location of the site in relation to East Church and get my mouse working. Uh, the site is roughly here. So you can see immediately on the edge of the um, this orange area, which is the, the designated holiday park area for the large complex at East Church and then you've got East Church Village here and um, the boundaries of which are uh, uh, highlighted by the red line. Um, just to give you um, a short planning history of the site, um, it, is in the, it is in the report, but essentially the site historically contained a holiday chalet that was granted in 1976 and you can see the what is now the former building here. Um, this picture was taken a, a a couple of years ago and it was in a fairly dilapidated state. Um, when it was granted permission as a as a holiday chalet, it included a condition that restricted occupation to between um, March and October um, in any given year. Uh, a lawful development certificate was submitted, an application sorry, for a lawful development certificate was submitted um, in 2020 and refused by the council, um, which was um, it sought um, a certificate for residential use um, and a planning application was then subsequently submitted in 2020 um, which was for an extension to this building that you can see here um, and conversion of the building to a residential dwelling. Um, the council refused that application and um, it was subsequently dismissed on appeal and the appeal decision is attached to the committee report. Um, the Holiday Chalet um, subsequently has essentially collapsed 
um, some work was being undertaken on it and um, it, it collapsed and has now entirely been removed from the site. And this building has been erected in its place. Um, and this is essentially what's subject to this current application. It's a single story, one bed unit proposed again for use as a dwelling. Um, the previous inspector um, in dismissing the appeal in 2021 for residential use um, dismissed that on the grounds that the site was poorly located um, in an unsustainable location away from services and facilities. Um, and also um, that um, the loss of holiday accommodation had not been uh, not been demonstrated um, that um, uh, sorry it had not been demonstrated that holiday accommodation it could not be used for holiday accommodation um, and there was no there was no justification provided um, for that um, the current application essentially obviously same scenario in terms of location of site you can't move the site um, officers consider that this remains unsustainable um, for use as a residential dwelling um, and no further information has been provided to demonstrate why um, a building on site cannot continue to be used for holiday accommodation. So essentially um, our recommendation is that the application should be refused um, and we've given a significant amount of weight to the appeal decision um, given the similarities between this scheme and the previous appeal scheme um, and obviously the very recent nature of that appeal as well. Um, officers have also um, recommended that the application is refused for two other reasons. One is um, failure to provide a SAMS payment. Um, as an update, the applicant has confirmed that if members were minded to approve the scheme, they would be willing to make that payment. Um, there is an, another reason for refusal which relates to the um, uh, internal layout and the amenities for occupants of this property. Um, sorry, there should be. Oh, what's happened here? That's not good. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Um, the, the applicants also provided this photograph, which shows um, the the area which will be used as a bedroom um, when the if 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 permission is granted and, and um, uh, if works internally uh, are carried out further. Um, and essentially what they've said is that in their opinion, they consider that there is enough light um, that the window provides to serve the bedroom. Our concern is, I'll go back to the photos, um, our concern is that the bedroom window is located um, along this area here um, and um, very close proximity to the, the boundary um, with landscaping that will obscure that window. Um, the applicant has suggested that they could overcome that by putting some form of roof light into the bedroom, which, 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 which may deal with the, the issue, but given the more fundamental reasons for refusals that officers um, consider um, relate to this application, we haven't pursued that with them. Um, so, yeah, thank you. Thank you. We now move on to public speakers. Could I invite Councillor Malcolm Newell from East Church Parish Council to speak? Uh, good evening all. Uh, I come on behalf of my uh, one of my people that live in my area. Um, I looked at the various things for refusal. Uh, one being reliant on a car. Transportation at this end of the island, I think, is the majority of people have cars uh, because there is no or a lack of ability, availability of public transport. We are in walking distance of the local shops, doctor surgery. Number two, the loss of holiday accommodation. Well, we have enough holiday accommodation on this island. 
which of most of it, we don't get any tax return as council tax at all from these people, so-called people, supposed to be here on a holiday, but most of them live here in accommodation as their full time, which they shouldn't be. Uh, we, as the people that live in my area, we all pay council tax and we've paid it since we've been there. <clears throat> uh, number three, I first came to live to the, on the island or come to look at to live on the island in 1999. Uh, I was told about Six Elm Way and I looked into buying it off of a chap called Joe. Joe Paul, his name was. I also went to the solicitor to find out whether it was livable for 12 months of the year, which they informed me it was. Uh, I made these inquiries. Uh, the answer to that was that I would do if it was to come up for sale in the near future. I moved to the property I'm after at the moment, which is in Surf Crescent, and I moved there in 2001. Unfortunately, uh, that property had already gone. Uh, so I moved into into Surf Crescent. Uh, Joe Paul paid full council rates when he lived there. And Ralph Pearman also paid council tax, full council tax. <laughs> the residents don't see why one property in all of this area in Elm, well, in Elm Way, it's the only property in that area that is not going to be residential. They're all residential. All the properties throughout my area are residential. Uh, I'd like to say one thing, and I think the owner has been victimised totally. I'm sorry to say that, but that's how I feel. And the young lady, I know it's me ending my time. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you. I'd now like to invite the agent, Hannah Garling, please. Good evening, members. The proposal is for a replacement bungalow for the applicant and her husband. The applicant purchased the property in 2018 and moved a caravan onto the site in 2019 as temporary accommodation, whilst the former bungalow was being renovated. During the renovation works, the bungalow was found to be structurally unsound and collapsed. The replacement dwelling has been constructed on the original foundations and the applicant is seeking to replicate the scale and massing of the former building. The applicant had believed the renovation works were permitted development and the property had a permanent residential use. It is recognised that the scheme does not sit comfortably within Swales local development plan, where the site is not within an allocated holiday park. However, there are a number of material circumstances which weigh in favour of granting consent. These are the original bungalow was granted in 1975 and has existed on the site for over 45 years. Support has been received from a local ward councillor and eight neighbours who recognise there is no harm and it will enhance the area. East Church Parish Council also has no objection. The replacement bungalow contributes to Swale's lack of a five-year housing land supply, where the presumption in favour of sustainable development applies. It would provide good quality accommodation for the applicant, and a draft SAMS mitigation agreement was submitted with the application, and the contribution will be paid upon a resolution to grant consent. The site is surrounded by residential development on three sides, with a holiday park on the fourth. In this context, it cannot be considered as isolated development in the countryside, where the normal planning tests would apply. It is an established residential plot and has been for many years. The replacement bungalow does not materially or significantly change the site from how it has existed since the 1970s. It simply maintains the long-standing use and provides a small-scale self-build dwelling. The officer refers to the site as being in an unsustainable location. The site forms part of an established community and benefits from an existing access and services in close proximity. The site is within a five to ten minute walk of a bus stop, which provides a link to Sheerness, where a wider range of services can be accessed. Yeah. East Church is within a 15 to 20 minute walk and offers a range of facilities. The proposal would have the same relationship to nearby services and facilities as the surrounding properties. 
In response to the unacceptable loss of holiday accommodation concerns, members should recognise that the Isle of Sheppey has over 6,700 holiday chalets and caravans, and this concern is unfounded. In response to the concerns of poor outlook and restricted light to the bedroom window, it is considered that the bedroom benefits from sufficient light levels and a pleasant outlook onto the boundary hedging. If considered necessary, a skylight could be put in and this could be secured by a condition. And just to note, the photo shown by the council is of the side elevation and not the rear. In summary, there are only benefits arising from the replacement dwelling. The scheme utilises an existing residential plot with an established built up area in a sustainable location. Members are invited to defer for a site visit to see the proposals in context. Thank you. Councillor McDonald, as you called it in, you have three minutes to speak. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Um, I joined the Council in the hopes that uh, I'd be able to help improve uh, the Isle of Sheppey and in fact the whole of Swale, which at times has had some pretty poor um, decisions made in the past. This is within the residential area of uh, East Church. Um, the boundaries of the, the caravan sites are quite clearly defined. Um, they make very little contribution to the uh, population, uh, to our tax. OK, some of them are business rated. An awful lot of these um, so-called holiday chalets are used uh, 12 months of the year. So we're not getting any, any benefit from that at all. This particular property was, um, as you say, was built 45 years ago. Um, I thought it had been a lot, a lot earlier, but uh, it's had 45 years of residential use. So um, I think maybe the applicant or their representatives hadn't argued the case probably with the inspector because uh, there is legislation in place with regard to uh, lawful development certificates. I did work for a law firm 100 years ago and uh, um, my my main expertise was in writs of mandamus, uh, which instructs for the whole of the southeast um, appearing before judges. So I have had a bit of experience. But the uh, 19, uh, sorry, the 2015 Act has been surpassed by the 2020 Act, and that's quite specific. If uh, a building has been occupied for uh, four years or more as a residence then the people are uh, entitled to a lawful development certificate. Now, I know it's being rebuilt because of the condition of it, but uh, my submission would be that uh, uh, that ought to be the case. It's within the residential area. Uh, it's not a holiday thing. Uh, an awful lot of these holiday, so-called holiday camps, uh, don't really produce anything for, unfortunately, for our community pot or swell council. Um, they're just a charge on the rates all the time. Uh, efforts in Sheerness, I think, are excellent, and that could well up the uh, uh, day uh, people in there. But uh, the uh, statute of limitation uh, is four years. So this more than exceeds that 45 years. So uh, my submission is that it would help to improve the residential area. There are 44. 44 existing properties in the whole of that block. So my submission is that it ought to be given planning and that would be the start of improving our poor island, which has been trashed. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor McDonald. I'd now like to move the office recommendation. Do I have a seconder? Thank you, Councillor Martin. I now open the debate. Councillor Hunt, thank you. Um, I think it, it's a shame. Um, that are in the position, but I think it is clear that this hasn't been residential. Um, it is done as as a holiday accommodation, and all all the arguments that have been made so far would be taken into account when we've got an appeal, and that appeal is a recent decision, and it's going to be very hard to to go against that. Um, if you refuse this now and go to appeal, that that will be taken as case law and, and looked at exactly the same. There is no difference. So uh, unfortunately, I, I don't think there is anywhere else to go with this one. Um, 
the concern as well is that this is a holiday accommodation. If this was other holiday accommodations on the island coming forward, a, a caravan or a chalet and wanting to build a house on it, we'd probably be looking at it and saying, no, it's it's in the countryside and you're it's, it's something completely different. Um, that is the case here. And so I think the officer's got the right decision. Thank you. Councillor Martin, please. I think the officers are probably on the right side in terms of looking at it in, from the holiday uh, accommodation change point of view. But we do have the ability as a committee to look in a slightly different way. And what we do lack within the borough, um, quite clearly, and we know we lack it, are sites for um, self-build units. Now, that could be a consideration that we may wish to make if we are minded to, uh, to consider that actually having space for self-build would be a positive in this area. I don't know where I'm going yet, and that's uh, that's a balance. So uh, I'd wait for the committee to convince me which way I'm going. Thank you. Councillor Marchington, please. Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, this is, uh, as I said, previous speaker just said it's a very difficult one because this is totally different to the notes I was making earlier. <laughs> um, we on Sheppey we do suffer badly from uh, 12 month residency with people using caravans and uh, chalets as permanent homes just moving away for a few weeks and coming back they have no other postal address or anything you know? um, and the danger is if this one goes to residency there'll be a torrent of uh, similar issues you know because we're right alongside so on um, the very fact it's surrounded it's got residential on one side and holiday on the other but so it all comes down in my mind at the moment is there any proof that they were paying residency rates i assume nothing's been submitted yeah thank you if 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 i can just um make a couple of comments there um the um I said obviously in the planning history that an application for lawful development certificate had been submitted for residential use of the site and the purpose of that certificate was um, to um, submit to the council that it had been used as a residential property for the relevant period of time. Um, there was some evidence as I understand um, that suggested that it had been used for residential purposes at times in the past. Um, I think the key issue here was that at the time the application was made, the property hadn't been lived in for a while. And from the condition of the property, um, I suspect that was very strongly the case. Um, so the um, um, the application was refused on on that basis. Um, and you know it remains the the case that in planning terms, um, the the only permitted use of that site is as holiday accommodation. Councillor Davey, please. Yeah, thank you, Chair. That's uh, I, I'm just going to follow up on that. Um, so what you're saying under uh, under planning terms that if uh, a place is uh, is registered as a holiday let, despite people having paid their full rates for it. Um, according to Councillor Macdonald there, once it becomes empty, it then reverts to a holiday let again. And uh, uh, have the, the current residents um, been paying a full council tax? Or uh, I understand they were living in a caravan alongside. Well, have they been paying a full council tax? Um, and if so, then why has it been taken off them if they're on a holiday let? Thank you, Chair. I don't think that's a planning question, really. No, that was, I was going to say that obviously, um, you know, we have a, a separate, the council deals with council tax um, under, under a separate department. That's not, a, 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 you know, something that planners deal with at all. Um, I mean, you know, there's, there's some very complicated case law regarding lawful, you know, lawful development certificates and when a, um, a, a building, you know, may or may not be deemed to be um, lawful um, as a residential use. Um, with all sorts of factors in terms of um, uh, how often it's, how long it's been used for, has that use been continuous, have there been breaks in that use? Um, like I say, when the application was, we, I understand that there has been some intermittent residential use in in 
in the past. I couldn't tell you for how long, um, but what I do know is that that lawful development certificate that was refused was refused on the basis that there had been a break in residential use before that application had been submitted for some period of time and that the council took the view that that wasn't lawful. So if it's not lawful, we are back in the position where um, the, the site only benefits from planning permission as a holiday let. And that's what we have to consider the application against. That's its lawful use. Thank you. Councillor Winchus. Thank you, Chair. I've been listening, to this, been listening to this debate very closely. It's a, this is a very difficult one for me, which why I'm going to go on this. Um, but I've got to say, I th think that it, we won the, or it's lost on appeal last time. <clears throat> and if we was to pass it this time, I think we could make ourselves look a bit silly, to put it in layman's language. It's a very difficult one for me, this one. But I think I feel I have got to go to the officers on it. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Henderson, please. Yeah, I, I think there's some quite interesting points have been made. Um, one of which is that we have 6,700 holiday homes on, on the Isle of Sheppey. Um, and another one by Councillor Hunt that um, what would be the position if we use this as a precedent to say, oh, it's OK, let's uh, let's allow it as uh, as a residential dwelling. Um, I've been on this council on and off for 35 years, and the council has fought all that time to try to ensure that holiday lets are not made to be 12 month residences. <clears throat> it's been a very difficult program hasn't always worked well, but I would be seriously worried on this one if we were to say, oh, well, don't let's worry. It's only one. Let's allow it to be a, a, a residence. That potentially. People would think. That that gives them the potential of opening up that whole debate for all kinds of areas of the Isle of Sheppey. Uh, and I think that would be very dangerous. I think it's a, a shame that we are where we are, but I, I do believe we cannot um, allow this as, uh, as a house when it's as far as I can see, always been um, a holiday dwell dwelling. Thank you. Thank you. There's another speaker, oh, Councillor Hunt. Yeah, I can just a quick one on self build because I think it is a, a good point, and we definitely need more self build um, sites and and plots coming forward. But I think just for me on that one that. Which isn't on the self build register at all. It hasn't been looked or assessed as a self build, and the application isn't a self build, so we can't be considering it along that and have to look at what it is. Thank you. Oh, Councillor Hall, please. I request that um, Cheryl and Neil take a call, like this. No, I think. I'm more than happy to make a comment if you let me know what you'd like me to make a comment on. I think basic points. Um, Mr Burns already summarised the planning use and the planning use is what the planning use is and is established by way of the planning system or through a certificate of lawfulness. Because a building or a piece of land has a particular use in planning terms, doesn't preclude something else happening on that, but that thing happening would be unlawful. 
So you could have a, for example, a, a residential house in the middle of a housing estate and somebody's running a hairdressing salon on the ground floor. That's technically potentially a change of use. They could still be doing that. And until somebody points it out, and you know, then we could look at enforcement and so on and so forth. But this, the use at that point in time would still be a residential use because it's a house. It was built as a house. It has permission as a house. So Councillor Daly's point, so Davy's point about the council tax, I do appreciate that's probably rather unfortunate if people have been paying, paying council tax and thinking they have residential use in that property. But in planning terms, its use is as a holiday let. It's controlled by conditions. Um, lawful development, Mr Byrne, again, is right. There is a lot of case law. When an application for a lawful development certificate of existing use is made, the assessment of the use is made at the point of the application. So if an application is made for existing use as a residential dwelling and the dwelling's falling down, there's no roof on it, it it's highly unlikely to be a successful application because it clearly can't be in residential use because of the state of the building. You know, you might have trees growing through the middle of the building and things like that. So those are assessments the officers would make. They, they also may have refused it on a, a lack of information, but I don't think that's the case. Um, so yeah, it, it's lawful uses as a holiday let. Notwithstanding what's been said about the fact that it's, you know, it is where it is, it's close to the settlement. It's not within the settlement. Papers set that out. The officer's view is that it's not sustainable. You can, you know, if, if it is sustainable, potentially make a case for it. Officer's view is it's not sustainable. The inspector's view was that it was not sustainable. The inspector's view is a very clear material consideration for you as a committee. Um, I don't really know what else I can say. So is there any particular question I can I can answer? But okay. Councillor Davies, please. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. I think I'm be coming back. So, um, just just a, a, some clarification on this. So, if we go with the officer's recommendation, uh, um, you know, I understand that what's been built so far has been built without any application in advance. So, if we go with the officer's recommendation, uh, is the suggestion that the build is complete and it then becomes a holiday let, and the current owner can stay there? For the the ten months, or will the recommendation be to demolish? Thank you, Chair. Well, the um, if planning permission is refused, then the building that has been erected to date is unlawful. So the usual procedure then would be for the council to start instigating enforcement action. If the applicant chose to make an application to retain the building and use it for holiday accommodation, then that would require another application for planning permission, and we would consider it on that basis. I think it's also worth um, reminding members that we can only determine, or you can only determine what's before you for determination. You've got an application here for residential use. You can't determine that it be a holiday let. That would be up to the applicant subsequently to change the, their mind on that one. OK, we'll now vote on the officer's recommendation, which is to refuse. All those in favour, please show. All those against? Abstentions? So that's 14 for one abstention. So uh, plan permission is refused, su refused, subject to issuing of the decision notice. Next, we move on to 3.2. Reference number 22 forward slash 504 818 forward slash full. And ask the officer if there is any update, please. Thanks, Chairman. Um, that's me again. 
um, I do have an, an update. Um, if I could ask members to turn to paragraph 9.6 of the report. It's a very, it's a very minor update. Um, the, the, the agent has advised that um, You'll see, you'll see in, the, in that paragraph that there's reference to the, the number of containers um, that are placed on the site and the agent has advised that um, there are 50 containers on the part of the site that currently benefits from a lawful development certificate and in the um, in the paragraph in paragraph 9.6 um, officers have referred to there being 45 units or 45 containers. Um, on that part of the site. So a small update there in terms of the, the number of containers that are on what is the, the lawful part of the site. Um, just turning to um, the application itself and to give you a quick presentation. So um, this application um, relates to um, the expansion of a self storage business on land at Chesley Farm in Newington. And the business operation is essentially um, uh, renting containers um, which are sited on the site for, for storage use, a kind of self storage um, business. And the site's located in the open countryside and approximately 0 0.8 kilometres south of Newington. Um, the existing farm buildings, which you can see here at Chesley Farm, have over a number of years been converted to non-farm uses, and that's evident in the um, planning history section of the report. Um, there's a residential use um, of this building here, um, and the remaining buildings are essentially in storage uses um, and workshop uses. There's an area of land to the westernmost buildings, um, which, sorry, yeah, lost my mouse, here we go. Um, uh, which of these buildings here, this area of land here, which is outside the application site, but part of the blue line, um, that land has for a number of years been used um, for the storage of containers and at some point um, uh, over that 10 over over the last 10 years the applicant has been operating on that land um, they've been operating the self um, uh, storage use and stationed a number of containers there so you can see here um, from aerial photos from our um, uh, from our, our historic maps that we have. Um, I think this photo on the left is taken in 2015. And you can see the area of land at the at the rear there and series of containers that are stored on the land. That, that site has the benefit of a lawful development certificate that was granted last year um, for this use um, on the basis that it was demonstrated that that use had been occurring and in place for period of at least 10 years. However, the site has expanded further. So this um, aerial photo on the right hand side, um, this is taken in 2018. Um, and this shows that this area of, you know, obviously the site has expanded. I've lost my mouse again for some reason. Oh, now it's decided to completely change the picture. Here we go. Right. So the site expanded here at some point around 2018. And then if we go to the latest Google Maps image, you can see then that the site has further expanded here. Um, and as you'll see from paragraph 9.6 in the update I gave you, there are approximately um, 50 containers in this location, which is a lawful location. And um, there are, I think it was 55, approximately 55 containers, 54 containers that have now been sited um, in these two areas of land um, to the north here and here. And in terms of site area, the site area has has roughly doubled um, through the expansion of the site into into those two areas to the north. Um, and and of course, because those um, that use hasn't been carried out there for 
um, a similar period to the um, to the original part of the site. Um, that's not lawful and requires planning permission. Um, hence, why we have this retrospective application. Um, so these are photographs of the site. Um, these are photographs looking from the the main access northwards. So you can see this is this is essentially the extended area of the site here, and this is the area furthest north. Again, that's the area furthest to the north. You can see it's just got rows of containers. This is looking back um, towards Ball Lane. Um, you've got the former farm buildings that have been converted and again the storage area on your on your right hand side. Again, that highlights the size of the two the two areas to approximately 1,290 square metres in terms of the expanded size. Um, so the expanded site has more or less doubled the, the site area of the operation. Um, we're in the countryside um, in a fairly remote location. Um, national and local planning policies do give support to economic development in rural areas, but that needs to be very carefully balanced against impacts upon the countryside and issues of sustainability. Um, given the size of the expansion um, and the quite sprawling nature of the expansion, um, together with the open land use um, uh, that's proposed here, obviously everything is, 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 is in the open, not contained within a, within a building. Um, our view is that the application is is unacceptable and harmful, and the recommendation is that planning permission should be refused. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd now like to invite the uh, supporter James Tumbler to speak, please. Good evening, members. Um, I've put an application or support letter in for this application. Um, I am a local businessman. Um, I am a director and shareholder of a local company. We currently employ 22 people from our office. We first used a storage container in this facility three years ago. Um, we started off with one container. Very quickly, as our business grew, we then took on a dry storage container. And consequently, this year, our business is growing further where we are currently looking to expand, excuse me, expand and take one further container, possibly two over the next 12 months from Chesley Storage. Um, we we operate these in and out of these containers very infrequently um, and probably over the last three years whilst I've attended this site, be it in a car or a van, which is just a small um, commercial van, nothing larger that we use. Um, I've probably only ever met three, four or five other occupants of these containers. Bear in mind, we've got two containers. We, we, we've never really come across anyone more than that. Um, the area is very peaceful. We've never, you know, there's never been any, what I've seen as disruption to the countryside. When I've attended in a van, you cannot see these containers from any point of coming into the property. So if you come via the golf course and up into it, you cannot see them. If you come over from the Hartlip area, you do not see these containers. They're not visible. Um, they are a colour that is in keeping with the countryside, I feel. Um, and if this application was refused, I as a businessman and as a, as a larger business, we would potentially look at moving our business out of the Swale area into the Medway area or Maystone area where there are storage facilities that will be able to support our business and our growing business. Um, with, with the complications of Brexit, we are importing larger quantities of, of materials that we then pull off on a, on a pool system. Um, and this, this facility here does give us that ability. Um, and and I, I, I am in full support of, of Chesley Storage um, and, and see no reason as to why this application should be refused. 
Thank you. Thank you. I'd now like to invite the agent to speak, please. Uh, good evening, Chairman and Members. I'm here this evening on behalf of our client, Chesley Storage. Firstly, we wish to apologise to Members and the Council for the retrospective nature of the application. The applicant has asked me to explain and apologise that he, he was not aware that planning permission was required for the expansion of the storage use, as he was under the impression that the planning permission granted, and I think it was about 2008 for the storage use, covered the entire site. Members will note that a large part of the site for storage use has been certified under a lawful development certificate, which was issued in April 2022. The application before you is seeking to, to regularise the use of the land at the rear of the site for storage use. It's not proposing any further expansion of the use. The storage use at Chesley Farm has been operating since 2008, and as far as we're aware, no complaints have been received from local residents, the parish council, or any other people or, or organisations over the past 15 years. And the application uh, before you has received no objections from the parish council, Kent Highways, or the council's environmental health officer. The hours of use associated with, with the use are limited to 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. Monday to Fridays and 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. on Saturdays. It's closed on Sundays and bank holidays. We acknowledge that the proposal before you does extend beyond the lawful site. However, we wish to point out the site is well screened from Ball Lane and the immediate surrounding area by the existing trees and hedgerows. In addition, we are proposing new tree and hedge planting and a wildflower meadow to provide a net gain and enhance the biodiversity of the area and to further screen the site. This is a relatively minor expansion of the business and it's been shown that no harm has been caused to the character of the area or to residential meeting as a result of the development. Both national and local plan policies support the expansion of businesses in rural areas. Chesley Story supports over local, over 80 local swell based businesses providing a local and efficient storage use, which is located in, in a sustainable location close to Sydney or Newington and the surrounding area. Without this facility, it's likely that a number of the businesses will be forced to find alternative storage outside the swale area and are therefore lost to the economy as well. We hope members will support the application, but I would like to suggest that it may be beneficial for all for members to hold a site visit so that it can view and properly consider the application. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'd now like to invite War Member Councillor Palmer to speak, please. Thank you, Chair. I called this application in, which um, raises concerns with me, particularly to the effect of a rural business and, and other local businesses. This, this application is for an extension to an existing rural business. This is compliant with policy DM3. Newington is classed as a rural service centre. This site is an existing site which is expanding. As the ward member, I have not received a single complaint or comment from residents. Newton Parish Council has no comment on this application. The only comments from residents on the portal are supportive and positive. I have received no complaints concerning an increase in traffic related to this site. At 9.6 of the, of the report, yes, the site is outside the belt up area. This site has been in use for many years without affecting the local wow. rural lanes. This sort of site is best suited away from the village boundary and within Newington, I doubt sufficient land is available. I must stress it is an existing business and a rural business at that, a business that we should be supporting. Many users are local businesses who themselves are expanding and wish to store items at this location. Some 70 plus local businesses use this service of this site. These businesses store goods and items 
there rather than risk the step into purchasing or renting a yard or work unit while of others have used the service for a couple of years and moved on to local units or yards. If permission is not granted, this will damage successful local businesses and will di directly affect small local businesses and traders who require such a site. Swale could see the loss of some small businesses into other local authority areas. Note, at 9.7, at paragraph 85 of the MP MPPF recognises that sites to meet business needs in rural areas may not be found in existing uh, settlement boundaries. This is a sound rural business and I cannot see why this application should not be granted tonight. The development is sympathetic to its surroundings and is supporting local businesses in a sustainable location and avoids the need for travel to greater distances for storage facilities in other local authority areas. However, if you are minded to refusing, then I feel a site visit would be a suitable alternative so you can see how well the site is maintained and is hardly visible from outside. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd now like to move the officer recommendation and I see Councillor Martin is seconding. Who would like to speak on this one? Councillor Hunt, please. Thanks. Was there an update from the officer first? Did we do that? Did we ever do that? Yeah. Um, right. I was awake, honestly. That's right. Yeah, no, I remember that now. Sorry. Um, I was listening. I just forgot where we were. Um, it was a good update. Um, I, I, I know of businesses using this, um, and I think it is going to have an impact on businesses. Um, but I do think that that should have been a consideration before it was done. B business have started using this when there hasn't been a lawful use in place, and that, that should have been considered from the very beginning. Um, with the applicant doing um, applications in the past and having they should have some knowledge of what is needed on the site. And I think that's an oversight that, that we do need to consider. I've got a question just to get a clarification on the use of this because it's been said about a lot of businesses using it and the impact and I think considering the rural economy has there been evidence with the application to prove how many businesses or is it just on the say so of of speakers tonight yeah, there's no detailed information in the application that tells us you know which units are rented out to which businesses and where those businesses are based like right thank you so so with that we haven't got the evidence before us to actually make that decision and sort of weigh up whether they're the, the impact on businesses um is going to be detrimental and the sort of weight of that should be given for the um building in the countryside but the other thing i do want to point out as well is we very recently had a refusal on exactly the same thing storage within the countryside at Bobbin. Um, that was containers being put in um, and the council have refused that. I think there has now been an appeal lodged with that, but I do have a concern that if we start looking at exactly the pretty much the same application um, with that appeal running as well and this one, we will be in a bit of a difficult position of saying that this is acceptable to to do um so i i think the officers have have got the the right reason um for refusing this i think if we did do a site visit none of that policy considerations is going to change um and i don't see that we need a, a site visit for it but it is a shame because it is a, a good business running and it is going to impact businesses but that should have been considered earlier on. Thank you. Uh, next up, Councillor Henderson, please. Thank you, Mr Chairman. I'd like to go back to the very principle of this. The first principle to me is that Swale Council should be supporting economic development in Swale. The second point is, from my own experience, and I, I'm sure this company much more so, 
lots of companies need accessible storage and that means it needs to be local my my training company for example um, because we do uh, contracting for the government we have to keep documents for 10 years um, if we kept them all in our training center we wouldn't have any room for people to come and do training so we certainly do use external storage facilities so if you take that as your principle then i think we should be doing all we can to say is this really a problem or is it acceptable and the thing which impressed me most was the, there were two pictures up at once um what one was uh seven years ago and one was no those two yeah those two um the, the one on the left was i think you said about seven years ago uh, and the one on the right perhaps three or four years ago and it's clear that on the right um there's been a considerable extension of trees shrubs hedges or whatever they may be and i'm surprised i confess that there have clearly been no objections to this at all if it was near a, a larger center um if it was for example, I, I live in Faversham. If it was near the centre of Faversham, people would probably object all over the place. But we found somewhere here, which it seems to me is not causing a problem. And yes, Councillor Hunt's right. If the uh, company had done this properly in the first place, they wouldn't have had so many problems. But I think we are where we are and i would suggest that the, the phrase here was um where are we in unsympathetic and incongruous in this rural setting it might be incongruous but i don't think it's unsympathetic it's not as if these containers were piled five high or anything and i believe this is not creating a precedent if we were to say this is a useful economic development for swale let's support it and uh, i think i would intend to vote against the uh, current officer recommendation thank you councillor winkler please Oh, thank you, Chair. Um, I'm afraid to say I slightly disagree with the previous speaker, though his views are valued to a point. I'm more inclined to agree with um, the previous speaker that um, if we were to pass this, how much further is it going to spread? Are we going to have these uh, units a lot further? So I will be going with the officer's recommendations. Thank you. Councillor Whelan, please. Thank you, Chair. I think we've heard both sides of the case. When I first saw this, I thought, yes, it is in Congress and out of keeping in the countryside. But having heard the ward councillor and councillor Anderson, I'm persuaded that we should permit this. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Marchington, please. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I, I come from a business world of, of containers. <laughs> I've been in site construction for many, many years, and uh, it was not uncommon for me to have six or seven containers and a gantry crane up for about 11, 12 years, no problem at all. But that was always, in my game, was always temp it's always, it was always looked upon as being temporary structures in, and not a permanent sort of structure. So they're removable, you know. So I don't know how that affects this. The, the only other point I'd like to make at the moment is that whenever we're looking at these uh, um, 
retrospective situations, we're supposed to look not what it's expanded to, is as to whether we would give permission for the whole lot as it was if it came forward to us then. And, and I think if we go permission to the previous one, and it actually come at that time for a larger section in the same plot, I think we would, we would if we agreed the smaller one, we'd have agreed the slightly larger one. Or I say it is larger, but of course we'd have had a lot of terms and conditions in um, shrubbery and hiding this fact. And and at the moment I see it, it isn't sort of an ugly looking site. It's easy to control, and therefore I, I actually will go against the officers on this one. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, can you just put up the um, proposed layout just to make sure members are fully aware of what they're voting on? So obviously the hatch area is what they what they want, and what's below the hatch lower hatch area is what's already containers. Just to make sure members are fully aware. Yeah, correct. So um, the 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 area within the red line, both hatched well, the, the hatched areas are are the areas that are subject to this application and aren't lawful. The area to the southeast of the larger hatched area is the is is essentially the extent of the um the area that's got the lawful development certificate. Councillor March Martin, please. Right, so I'm going to take a slightly opposing view to Councillor Hunt on this one. I think when we look at yes, we've recently said no to a similar thing in another rural area. That wasn't from memory on an existing site. It wasn't an extension, it was a new. Now we would be more likely to grant permission for an extension to a site to meet demand for any sort of business in an area, rather than suggest building in open countryside um, away from an existing and established business. So I think actually in terms of that, I don't think the argument of this is going to weaken a certain appeal is as strong uh, necessarily uh, as first thought. I think we are in a situation where we, we have an offer of biodiversity net gain. I think it's relatively acceptable. I think we do have to support businesses in the rural community and there is going to be an ever increasing need for storage. Um, I shall give the prime example. Uh, you and a gas engineer these days, um, they want to store more of the um, diverter valves themselves because you have to wait four weeks for them to come in um, from abroad if, you, if you're ordering them from abroad. So actually people want more storage. It suits local businesses. It's an extension of a current one. I think it's relatively acceptable in the grand scheme of things. Councillor Hunt. Sorry, I keep coming back tonight. Can, can we just again clarify what has got approval? What has got is there as an existing business that is just there because of the lawful use of how long it's been there for so long um and then the addition to it because i think there is a difference between an existing business and an existing business that's there just because we can't take any action against it because of the time period so there's been no planning permission granted for any um open storage use on the site um, so there's no that none of this benefits from planning permission itself. Um, as I've identified earlier, it's this area here. Which benefits from the lawful element certificate by virtue of having been there for a period in excess of 10 years and immune from enforcement action. Thanks, Jess, I'm just coming back on that. So th this is just a, a consideration, I think we need to have it, is a business that's there that probably shouldn't be there. So it's when we're talking about it's OK and acceptable to have the business there and it's just an extension, I think you do need to consider that that probably wouldn't be there if it was a case of having a full application in right from the beginning. Um, it's a slightly difficult one to answer because, you know, sort of part of the whole concept of lawful development certificates is it that if they have been there for a certain period of time and are lawful, that, you know, that's that's that essentially. I don't think we can penalise um, an applicant for benefiting from a lawful development certificate. 
I just clarify, I wasn't I wasn't saying that. I was just sort of making the point that we're saying about there's an existing business. Um, there is, but it's only through a lawful use. And from the history of the site, I think we we could have been looking if if things were different that there wasn't a business there. So that's that's all I'm getting at, rather than the actual site itself from, from the lawful use is 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 dealt. I think I think maybe the better way to, for me to put it would be that you know there are two avenues that potentially um, get you you know a, a, a lawful stroke permitted use on the site. One is by getting planning permission, and the other is through a benefit of a lawful development certificate. And they're both you know perfectly legitimate avenues for um, people and businesses to use. Um, so um, yeah, you know that part of the site benefits from a lawful development certificate. Councillor Henderson, please. Could I just come back briefly on that? Because I think we're being dragged off the point here. Uh, as somebody said on, on a previous application, we have to decide the application in front of us. And the application in front of us is for an extension of site. A lawful development certificate is just as valid as a planning certificate uh, and we absolutely should not damage a, a hopefully successful business because for whatever reason they perhaps didn't do things the right way 10 years ago what is almost to me more important is if this place has existed for 10 years without any problems, then it seems to me it's a pretty good indication that it's a good place to have it. And uh, I think we, we must accept that the Lawful Development Certificate, as the officer says, is a valid approval for use. Thank you. Right, I think that's debate closed. So we're going to move to the vote. Good. Um, all those in favour of the offer recommendation to refuse, please show. Against. And myself as tension. Yeah. Okay, so that motion is lost. Um, um, yeah. That's the Henderson, please. May I propose that we uh, approve the application? Um, with such conditions as the uh, uh, officers deem are necessary. Obviously, if we're reminded to approve, we need um, sound and just reasons why. Yeah. So it, it is for members to give us those reasons. Well, because it because it's not unsympathetic and incongruous. Um, it, we approve it because it, it is an acceptable use in an acceptable location for an acceptable economic development reason. I, I don't know what more reasons one has to give. I mean, I, I could be blunter than that and say <laughs> we approve it because we think the officers are wrong, but that doesn't really help very much. <clears throat> um, 
if it helps, there is a obviously the case law determines that where it's in the public interest that and it's an office an overturn of an officer recommendation, we do need to be very clear on the reasons. Um, I would go far uh, so far to venture that probably it's fairly obvious from the debate that's been had this evening that the committee's view is, as you said, Councillor Henderson, that you disagree with the officer's assessment about the amenity sort of aspect of it, um, and equally that you weigh very very heavily the economic benefits that will come from the scheme, including supporting local businesses. So I think it's fairly inherent from that sort of debate that that's probably the reasoning. So if, unless there's anything else that you wanted to add in terms of, of why you think it's good, then I think that's well, probably sufficient. I don't mind the phraseology, but. to uh, develop. So your reason for approving it is the overwhelming economic benefit. A lack of harm is not a reason to approve. The overwhelming economic right. benefit would be your reason for approving. I would have thought a lack of harm was a reason to approve. It's, it's a negative reason rather than a positive reason and we're looking well, for positive okay. reasons. Councillor Marchington, please. Yes, yeah, can I put forward that it's a, a rural storage facility. It's not a not permanent structure, uh, and that uh, and ag rural businesses always have storage. Every farmer's barns in that kind of wedding. Sorry, this is an application for a permanent permission, not a temporary permission. Councillor Bonnie, please. Thanks. Um, I, I think when this, if this is granted on based on the proposal um, that's been put forward, it should limit it to storage. The whole discussion has been around it being a storage base. Um, and I'll, I think, you know, that's its current use. We wouldn't want to see a broader use than that, um, as all the discussion has been around that. But I think, well, Councillor... Um, uh, the, the proposed this said uh, is that any harm to the countryside is mitigated somewhat by the landscaping that's there. It's quite a sheltered, yeah. It's the that it's. I suppose the assessment of any harm um, has been somewhat outweighed by the existing um, foliage, flora and fauna that's there. So the trees, etc., hedgerows that are there is quite well screened from the uh, neighbouring uh, properties. So I think, as we've been doing recently, we've been delegating most conditions, but obviously if you want to come in on any specifics, we obviously want the standard conditions that always come. But yeah, thanks, Ch uh, Chairman. I just wanted to, I've just jotted down a few um, sort of key conditions that um, I think members may want to consider. Um, one is that if we grant planning permission um, for this as a storage use, then clearly, you know, the containers could be replaced by other storage uses that perhaps had a greater impact. So um, do we want to limit the permission to the storage of containers only? Do we want to limit the fact that they can only be, um, they can't be doubled up in height? Um, potentially the colour of the containers, yep. number of containers, yep. hours of operation, illuminate any external illumination and landscaping. I think the landscaping one is quite important because the uh, the agent did say that they were going to improve <coughs> the ecology and biodiversity of the site. And they were talking about a, a summer meadow, and I think he said hedges and or trees. Uh, and, and so the provision of that yeah, is there's, part of the condition. There's a landscaping scheme that's been submitted with yeah. the with the drawings. Mm -hmm. Okay, before we continue, um, I'd like your permission to extend Stan Nilders. Hopefully we only, only have one. Councillor Hunt, please. Thanks, Chair. The point I was going to say was that the 
from from what we're saying, but I think it's already been picked up now and sorted. But that was the the landscape harm is outweighed, or the the positive benefits to the business is outweighed by the harm that the landscape is is bringing forward. Um, but also just a condition, I don't know if it is possible, but if we are saying that this site can only be used for storage and um, be in containers, whether there's a condition that if those containers are removed and the site ceases to be used for that purpose, that it is put back into use as um, originally for um, whether it, we say it be farmland or countryside use again. <laughs> Have a think. Councillor Martin, please. Uh, just to move things along, I think we're still awaiting a second of the proposal, and I'm happy to second as such to get this moving. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Darby, next, please. Okay. Jim, one of the things I think it's probably been answered, but I was going to say at the moment, if we're looking at what is there, something like 95 to 100 containers on the site. And if we're going to, if we are going to let pass this, could that make that the limit? Um, we can only apply conditions to the area of the site that's being extended. So we can't condition the entire site. The application can only impose conditions on that extended area. So um, I think the I think the report states there are 54 containers on that extended area. So we could impose a condition that states no more than 54 containers. Yeah, because I mean, you can see this coming back. But we can't, but we can't control the number of containers yeah. on the site that benefits from the loss of You can see this coming back, you know, with another 50 and, you know, and so forth. And I think uh, Councillor Hunt's actually said what I was going to say as well, and that is if they do pull these containers off, that it's returned to the countryside. Thank you. I don't think we can reasonably impose a condition that requires it to be returned to countryside because it's not it's not an application for temporary planning permission. Um, you know, we grant the development as you know, uh, well, uh, as proposed or in this case as undertaking uh, undertaken. And um, if for any reason the business ceases on the site, um, and the containers are removed. I don't believe we have the ability or power to re to require hard standings and things like that to be removed. So we could actually see this in five years' time when all the containers are gone, come back as um, 200 houses for a brownfield site. They'd be pretty small houses, but um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think I think if if members, are, you know. Normally, normally permanent with, with permanent development, you can't then basically state if for any reason that development stops, it everything is removed from the site. If it's a temporary permission, fair enough, but this isn't a temporary permission, or the application isn't for temporary permission. I think as well, just to add to that, you know, this is an application for a change of use of the land, so it's a bit like what we were talking about earlier with the holiday let or the residential use. This is a permanent change of the use of the land. It, it will have that, that use lawfully. That means if the use ceases on there, it's probably technically brownfield land. You know, that will then factor into any future application in terms of assessment. It wouldn't be reasonable to require that if the, the company, for example, fell on hard times, wanted to reduce their operation, went into liquidation, anything like that, that we would say right now you've got to turn it back into the countryside because potentially what they might want to do is sell the business as a semi going concern, clear any, you know, if they had debts, clear any debts, you know, whatever they wanted to do. But because it has the benefit of planning permission, you know, it, it wouldn't be reasonable to say, oh, but by the way, if you if you don't do that anymore, we want you to put it back. It, it would be like giving somebody, uh, I don't know, permission for an extension on a house. And then saying, oh, by the way, if you sell the house and move out, you've got to take the extension down. I think it, it, it wouldn't be very reasonable. Um, and, and I don't think it would be a, a, a condition that would pass the test. I'm, I'm sorry, point of order, Mr Chairman. We have approved this planning application. We have provided... No, we haven't. We haven't <laughs> I'm still debating whether we're going to vote on what we've proposed. 
Oh, I'm sorry. I thought we'd done. I thought we'd done that. Yeah, Councillor Davey, please. Okay. Yes. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, there was nothing mentioned during the um, the various speakers about what is being stored in the containers, and I was thinking of the conditions we were talking about and limiting the storage um, to exclude hazardous chemicals and or gas bottles. Uh, but because nothing was said during the initial debate, I don't know if that is a condition we can put in place. Thank you, Chair. I mean, my gut feeling is that that would be governed by other legislation. Um, it would also be incredibly difficult to enforce because who knows what's inside a container. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so the proposal is we approve subject to conditions, delegated conditions. So all those in favour of that proposal, please show. Those against, please show. Extensions. That's carried 10 for three against and two abstentions. Um, so plan permission is granted subject to the issue of decision notice and with conditions delegated. We're going to move on to 3.3 now. William's run away. No, we'll save best till last. You get to go. Oh. It's not my reason for it, but oh. I'm not that nice. <laughs> so, right, 2.5. So the reference number is 224 slash 504 622 forward slash full, 42 Station Road, Tenham. Um, and I'd like to invite the officer for an update, please. Yeah, thanks, Chairman. Um, good evening, everyone. There's there's no update to the report for this one, so I'll just go on a run through through the um, through the application. Um, so it's an application for a garage conversion, a single story rear extension, and a first floor side extension to 42 Station Road, which is outlined in outlined in red here. Um, it's a bit unusual for this side of Station Road, in, in the um, on the basis that it's detached. Most of them are a terrace properties and also it's got um it's got its own parking as well which is which is unusual for that side of station road um in terms of the separate elements of the application um i'll move actually i'll move on to the next one to, sh to show this so this element of the building here um is essentially already mostly already existing um, they're going to put a new a proposed to put a new roof onto it and a 1.6 meter extension onto the uh, far end of that element there. The garage, which is currently here, is proposed to be converted, and and a first floor added here, which will be on the side of the property. I'll show that in a bit more detail in these photographs. And um, so, as you can see, here's here's the existing garage. Which will be um, which will be converted. Um, first floor extension will go above that, so it will be set back quite a long way from the from the front elevation. And I'm just moving on to the next slide. So here's the existing ground floor element. This will be extended at the at the back and a pitch roof put over it. In terms of the impact on on neighbours, um, the best photograph for this will be. Bear with me, it's just coming up. So all all of the all of the elements of the application are on this side of the property, and as you can see, there's an access road which runs immediately adjacent to it. So the property on this side is is separated by. Um, 
well, quite a large distance um, to, to the point that I don't think there'll be any un unacceptable impact in that respect. On the other side, I'll show the um, I'll show the site location plan. As you can see, there's a, there's a gap to that property, um, and again, all the elements of the application are on the opposite side. So, um, overall, it's considered that the that the application is acceptable. Um, officers don't feel that there's there's any real harm to to residential amenity or visual amenity, um, and for those reasons. Um, the recommendation is for approval. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I'd now like to move the officer recommendation. Do I have a second? Thank you, Councillor Martin. Any discussion? Councillor Davey. And no I just one to keep everyone. No, it's, I, I just um, referring to six point two. The, the garage is 2.6 metres. It can't be used for anything really at all. So uh, I can't see any reason to object. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Winkless, if you're quick. Thank you, uh, Chair. I wish you come back with quick comments, don't I, in my usual fashion. Um, there's been no um, objection from the neighbours, so I can't see any reason to go against the officers. Thank you. Good luck. I'd like to move us to the vote. All those in favour, please show. So that is unanimous. So plan of permission is granted subject to the issuance of notice and conditions. So we're now going to move on to 3.3. Reference number 21 forward slash 505 498 forward slash out, and that's land off of Swan Tree Avenue, City Mall. I'd like to ask the officer if there's any update on this one. Thank you, Chairman. Um, well, members will be aware of the tabled update um, for this for this item. Hopefully, you've got that in front of you. Um, there's there's literally one small amendment to part three of the update. The affordable housing that's been offered um, by the applicant, so appellant rather, is thirty percent rather than. 20% stated in the paper and as members will be aware our policy is 10% for sitting board so it's not 100% markup it's we'll be going from 10% to 30% so they're up they're offering what as I say more than more than the set out in the in the paper but other than that the, the positions are set out in the um, in the papers, they, they've lodged an appeal against non-determination, and um, that, that appeal's up and running. And we're, we're looking for members of agreement to the, um, the putative reasons are set out in the report. Um, with the with the delegation to refine it, as set out in point three in the update. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. I'd now like to invite Councillor Gibson to speak. And remind you, you have three minutes. Thank you, Chair. Firstly, can I say that it's regrettable that this committee is not in a position to determine this application. And clearly, if that have been, I wholeheartedly align myself with the officer's assertion that permission should have been refused. Whilst the application site is principally within Woodstock Ward, its location clearly has significant implications for the residents which I represent in Roman Ward. The proposed development is outside of the built up area of Sittingbourne, and as a consequence, it is difficult to understand how safeguarding the intrinsic value of the countryside could be realistically achieved. It's important as ward councillors that we represent our residents' goals of preventing the erosion of the countryside gap and consequential loss of even more of this borough's open countryside, which once lost, is lost forever. A direct consequence of granting permission for this site would be damage to the landscape quality in an area designated as high landscape value and the loss of best and most versatile agricultural land. Whilst the applicant asserts that not a significant amount of BMVA land would be lost, for my residents, any loss of BMVA land is significant and unacceptable. The infrastructure in the immediate and surrounding area is simply not adequate to support this scheme. 
the local schools are already well oversubscribed. You have more chance of seeing a tooth fairy than a GP or dentist, and a local road network ensures that journeys already need to be planned by reference to a calendar rather than a watch. Using the applicant's own assumptions, a development of 135 homes would generate a further 324 registration requirements for GPs at a time when surgeries are either closing or have closed their books for new patients. So how will these occupants access health care? I'm also not convinced that the highways and transport reports reflect anything like the reality or current existential and future impact on the road network. But it'd be interesting to see an independent review of this. Bearing in mind reviews were initially conducted during COVID lockdown times and subsequent reviews appear not to have been particularly extensive. The developer asserts that leaflets were delivered to approximately 717 households and businesses within the proximity of the site. So what is approximate and what is meant by proximity? Both terms are very subjective and a more transparent, transparent way of quantifying both would have been for the developer simply to state the numbers and specify the area classified as within proximity. Having reviewed submissions from respondents to the consultation, in my opinion, there is overwhelming evidence that residents are truly opposed to this application. In closing, I know that our officers have arrived at the correct conclusion in their views on this application and urge members to support their reasons for refusal had this committee had the opportunity to determine the application. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Gibson. Um, I'd like to invite Councillor Rolls, please. Thank you, Chair. I think much of what I'm going to say has already been said. But anyway, as the rep, uh, representative Roman Ward has one of the two ward councillors, I am fully support the officer's recommendation for refusal of the application. This committee have been in a position to determine the outcome. This application site is not in the local plan, and many would suggest for good reason. Its location would fail to protect both the countryside and the rural setting. Being located outside the, de the defined urban build-up boundary of Citybourne, the proposal would set the countryside gap to diminish and lead to determination of loss of um, theocratic open countryside. In this area, we continually suffer from the decline of health care provision with uh, access of doctors, dentists, and in many cases already difficult to and impossible. Our open spaces and countryside undoubtedly provide the opportunity for both improvement of physical and mental health. And this scheme, in my opinion, puts these benefits at risk. Furthermore, the schools are cracking in terms of capacity and our road networks are already struggling to participate at peak time. I would finally add that I have grave concerns about the adequacy of service water management in the light of the fact that KCC are already engaged in ward for the provision of additional and alternative service water management schemes. Quite simply, this is a result of existing provision of being willful, inadequate, and the properties in the ward are regularly subject to influx of flooding water. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. I'd now like to move the office recommendation. Councillor Martin has second. I'd now like to open the debate. Councillor Bonnie, please. Thank you. Um, I note there's comments there from uh, Robinson Parish Council. I wasn't involved in that response, so I was free to speak at this committee without predetermination. Um, this feels a little bit like Groundhog Day, this application. It's disappointing that we are having to make a decision um, now that it's gone to appeal. Um, I'd like to ask what 
the Kent Downs response was, and I know it's not in the boundary of the Kent Downs, but I'd like to know if you asked them what their view was. Um, I'm not sure off the top of the top of my head whether we we consulted them, mindful that the site is quite although it's on in an area of high landscape value and is sensitive in landscape terms, it is quite some distance from you know, A and B yeah, doesn't doesn't um, doesn't come north of the M2. So as members will be aware, that this site is um quite well separated from the A and B. Um other thing I was say, and I kind of didn't expect to be presenting this, so I was slightly um, broad-sided um, to be presenting it, um, was that the second reason for refusal for surface water drainage, um, we actually need authority to to not run that reason because the technical consultee that we'd have been relying upon, KC Drainage, have, have recently confirmed, um, I believe it was this afternoon, that, that they've looked at the information that the appellants have provided and they're no longer objecting to the application. So, yeah, if we can drop that putative reason, but we, we still obviously have the main reason um, with the amendments to, to focus on for the appeal. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's fine. Do you bring Cheryl in. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I actually just uh, asked if I could just come in um, through the chair. Just so members are aware, you're, you're obviously aware this is an appeal situation. It's non-determination. Um, the appeal is up and running, as has been pointed out by Mr Wilson. Um, I spent some time this morning discussing um, some early parts of the case with the barrister that we have appointed to take this forward. It's currently listed for public inquiry. Um, we are hoping to see if we can have that reduced down to a hearing um, we'll see how we go with that. But over the course of the discussions this morning, the, the drainage point was, was a live issue. We were still waiting for a response from KCC. Mr Wilson's just highlighted that KCC have now said they're satisfied. So we will um, be requesting that that reason for refusal is not taken forward by the committee. That would leave you the two reasons for refusal on the papers. One being the, the landscape based, but picking up issues of um, agricultural land and, and other points. And the other one being the absence of a legal agreement, section 106. And again, I must advise that that will be something that is highly likely to fall away by the time the appeal is actually heard. I'm dealing with that section 106 agreement. I've spent the afternoon drafting. Um, and we'll be negotiating that with the appellant solicitor. So once we get to hearing stroke inquiry, most of, of the issues around Section 106 will be dealt with. So we will most likely be defending one reason. But notwithstanding, I would retain the, the lack of Section 106 as a reason at present, but with an understanding that if we reach the appeal and this section 106 is in fact in place, that we won't then defend that reason. Because if they renege on the deal, for want of a better word, and don't sign a section 106, that leaves us very high and dry. Um, so, so I would suggest that. Um, and the last point I would make is in respect of the appeal, um, Mr Allwood, who's obviously had to, to leave, is the, the lead officer on that. He has a deadline of tomorrow to submit our statement of case our statement of case is obviously going to be founded in what you decide this evening. So I would just urge you to be very clear in your reasoning. If there are additional things you feel are important and that come up through debate, um, you know, on, on the advice of officers, myself, we can assist in, in sort of considering that. But we do need to have a, a really good, robust set of reasons because that needs to be put into the statement, which goes to PINs tomorrow. Thank you. No pressure then. <laughs> OK, right. Um, 
And the reason I asked about the Kent Downs AONB is because if you mm -hmm. speak to them, um, read any of their documents, whilst they uh, reside over preside over the air of the AONB, the adjacent, the setting of the AONB is extremely important. And actually the dry chalk valley that runs south here and along um, Highstead Valley and down to the point of this site is a really important factor. It's an extremely rare chalk valley for geological formation. Um, it has a significant impact on the water supply for Sittingbourne. The SP, the, the drainage area starts up by the science park, but actually the geological chalk formation runs that whole valley. So in terms of landscape, it's not just that it's some pretty fields, it is a significant geological feature. So I'd like that to be noted. Um, in terms of um, facilities and accessibility, um, I would like to hi highlight that there is a significant issue at the junction of Highstead Road and Brenchley Road and Swanstree Avenue and uh, South Highstead. Um, if you're putting in the number of homes that they're proposing here, there is no safe route to walk to school if you're walking to Highstead or you're walking to the doctor's surgery. You have to cross Swanstree Avenue and take your life in your hands at the junction of Highstead Road there. There have been numerous near misses and accidents on that junction there, and they've put in those islands, which quite frankly are laughable because the number of times the actual beacon, yellow beacon, has been knocked over, and the, council, the ward councillor is nodding his head here, um, on those islands, and people have driven the wrong way over those islands, um, and this was part of KCC's traffic calming measures with the traffic calming along Swanstree Avenue is a scheme that I think locally we all laugh at because it has made KCC look like highways, look like a laughing stock. Um, I think most people actually want those bumps removed. Um, but the, the priority here is about pedestrian safety and accessibility into town. This is not a sustainable location um, because, as I said, you take your life in your hands um, getting her there. But if you get to the doctor's surgery at the memorial, which is the largest one in the whole of Sittingbourne, we also have the Tenham surgery is relocated there. You haven't got a cat in hell's chance of trying to get an appointment. I haven't seen a physical doctor in that surgery for the last three years. It is really difficult to to get to see anyone so i think the officer's conclusion here is right but those specific points on sustainability in terms of the environment and the um serviceability for the needs of the occupants who may live there needs to be taken into account so if it does get granted and there's a section 106 i would strongly recommend that there is some significant upgrade to Swanstree Avenue and that High Street Road Junction and that there is a footpath put in to accommodate the needs of pedestrians walking safely into town. That is an absolute minimum that would be required if that was to go to appeal and they were to win. I'd just like to um, extend standing orders before we continue if everyone's happy. Well, not happy, but <laughs> of course. Councillor Bonnie, can I just check on that point? Forgive me, because I vaguely know Sittingbourne in that particular area, but I don't know it very well. Um, 8.99 in the report sets out three or four highway contribution projects that are going to be secured through the 106, and that includes uh, 8.99 on 274. We've got highway improvement works, including 182,500 towards Highstead Road pedestrian footway and safety scheme, 14,500 for the A2 Rectory Road Junction, and 15,500 for highway improvement works at A2 Swanstree Avenue Junction. So I don't know if that... Assists. When they say Highstead Road, I thought they meant the rural lane further up going towards Robmersham. I wasn't entirely convinced it was the other way. So I just want to make sure that that's absolutely clear. 
Yeah, I haven't actually got the details in front of me of precisely what it is, but it is set out more detail in more detail in the consultee response. And from my recollection of what I was doing earlier today, it makes reference to a drawing as well, um, which is one obviously one of the application drawings. So we will be able to make sure that we can pin down where that scheme is for. And can we also make sure that there is absolutely no slip up, that there absolutely has to be an NHS contribution? We can't go through the pain of what we've got with Stones Farm. Council, oh, if you want to come back. Councillor Marchington, please. Oh, thank you, Chair. Um, I'd just like to highlight points that have already been made, really. But uh, the main thing is, is, is agricultural land. It's a good value. And this country is going to really suffer if it starts losing too much more in the future. There will come a time when we're going to really regret the decisions we made on so building on agricultural land. And there are lots of other sites inside the, the bound, built up boundary as well that are available. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Stephen, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, the Highstead Road uh, upgrade of the footpath down there. Um, I've been banging on for this for the last ever since I've been a councillor and uh, it is desperately needed. And if you're going to put more dwellings there, the only route into uh, Sittingbourne Town Centre is via Highstead Road. And uh, a footpath is, you know, you'd have to have one there. Now, that's my first point. But uh, it's uh, looking at the rural plan response here. Um, the, uh, they're saying that uh, uh, development of agricultural land will only be permitted when an overriding need that cannot be met on land within the built up area of boundaries. So, I mean, I'm, sh I'm sure there are, or we, we planned it in our local plan, I would have thought, to accommodate this. But the other thing is um, there is no alternative site on land of lower grade. Now, I don't think you can get a higher grade land than what that is already. It's got fantastic orchards there. You pick your own. It's well used by locals and uh, and visitors to swell. And I think that uh, losing that, we're losing our countryside. And uh, again, we're supposed to be the Garden of England. It's gradually disappearing. Thank you. Council Whelan, please. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, can I... Uh bring everybody's attention to page 237. At the bottom of the page, above where it says Rodmush and Paris Council objects to these plans, those three lines there covers everything that everybody said so far this evening. And I'm mindful that in the past, We've lost cases by being too verbose and detailed. So keep it brief, please. <laughs> Councillor Hunt, please. Thanks, Chair. Um, I, I agree with, with the officers that have come up with the reason for refusal. Um, but I think there's some other points within the document just to consider. Um, especially on on page where are we 259 and I'm thinking of the policy comments that we've got um, that the site was promoted for development through the local plan review and was previously discussed as a potential allocation for bearing fruits I think we just need a bit more consideration on that because it wasn't only discussed as a potential allocation, it actually went through in the final Schlar document as a site that was achievable and deliverable. Now, I think that is a, a point that we do really have to consider with it because it was only removed from the final documents when it went to the local plan panel at the time. Um, and I don't think that the evidence really was was looked at as giving justified reason why that should be removed. And I think that is something that's going to come up at appeal um, and possibly with, I would say, possibly with the applicants um, having a, a good reason come forward in their favour with that one. Um, but it hasn't been looked at 
I think in enough detail within the report. Um, if we're looking at the balance on this, and it, it is a fine balance as recognised in here, I think we have got the updates in here, which are the contributions, and I think we do need to, to consider how much money would be coming for schooling. Schools are a, a massive thing that we, we do need in the area. And for secondary and primary school, we're getting over a million pounds from this to, to deliver a new on land and the new school itself um, towards it. So I think that is a massive consideration that we do have to, to give. On the landscape, I think again, it has potentially been missed a little bit more that the mitigation that could be done on the site for the number of houses um, could potentially get that balance that it actually goes in favour of approval. We it says in there about in the past it hasn't been um, approved and there was it was going to appeal but was withdrawn but that was 580 houses which has a much bigger impact on the um, landscape. So I, I think it's it's going to be finally bad. I think the, the one point to go forward for on, on the landscape is the right one. Um, I'm not so sure with the other bits whether we have got a chance at appeal. I think it's going to be interesting to see it. But I actually think I'll probably be the only person and I'm quite happy to be different all the time. And but I will go against the officers on this one. Yeah, thanks. Um, one thing I did picking up on the points about the agricultural land is the viability of what's left. And I do think that is a really important consideration that's included within the report, and I give that significant weight. Thank you. So I thought I'd make myself useful up here. Um, <laughs> I've not just been checking the football scores. Um, yeah, your point about um, Heisted Road, and I, I know exactly what you mean. I found the um, the drawing in the in the transport assessment, and the proposal is for a footpath um, down Heisted Road. So that's obviously what that refers to. Yeah, you can. It's on the side that Heisted School is. So you know where the boundary fence runs along that side. Yeah, Western. Just purely because we don't, you know, if it wouldn't be a proper planning committee if I don't mention the word affordable housing at some point in it uh, and say, yes, it's very nice to see a, a, an offer of 30% within Sittingbourne, but is this not really in the countryside cap and therefore should be under the rural policies at 40%? So it's not actually a 200% increase. It's a, you know, it's a slight loss, but, you know, although I would like that number of affordable houses, please, somewhere. OK, then I think it's time for the vote on this. Um, all those in favour of the officer's recommendation to refuse, please show. All those against the officer's recommendation. And abstentions. And to see. Go for it. Just to be clear as well, it's not actually in favour of refusal because it's an appeal. It's what you would have been minded to decide had you had the power to determine the application yourselves. Um, thank you. So therefore, had we been making the decision, we would have refu uh, recommended refusal for the reasons outlined in uh, point one and three. Okay. okay. We we'll now move on to 2.1. Is there any further declarations of interest on this? Councillor Bonnie, please. Yes, as um, decisions around Master's House were made when I was a cabinet member, I thought it was better that I excuse myself from the discussion and I'll leave the chamber. Thank you for your part attendance. Uh, I'll come back when we talk to the other items. So just can you call me back rather than me stand out there like a dork? <laughs> we'll try to remember. Uh, Councillor Martin. I'll follow suit because I'm sure at some point at a cabinet meeting I'll vote for something. Fair enough. Enjoy your cigarette break.
Right, so we're on 2.1, application number 22 forward slash 504 876 forward slash full. And it's Masters House, Trinity Road, Sheerness. Is there any update on this one? Thank you, Chairman. Um, no update, um, just a very brief presentation. Um, I'm sure members are well aware um, of Masters House and Sheerness um, in the conservation area, um, non-designated heritage assets. Um, the council owns the property. Um, permission was granted last year by this committee um, to carry out various renovation works to the, the main house. Um, and also to convert a range of outbuildings with some roof alterations into uh, workshops. Um, conditions three and 10 of the planning permission relate to these current outbuildings um, and require details, more detailed drawings of um, uh, section drawings of, of, of the roof design. Um, and also require information as to how the workshop will meet BREAM standards, which are sort of commercial energy standards. Um, those conditions, <clears throat> as they're currently worded in the planning permission, um, state, have to be discharged before any development takes place on the site. Um, however, um, the intention is that the main house will be renovated and um, uh, the works will take place to that building first and at a later date the outbuild the intention is that the outbuildings will be converted at a later date so um, the applicant wants to amend conditions three and ten to essentially vary the wording which um, allows the work in the main house to, to 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 be carried out without being in breach of those conditions, but for those conditions to then bite when works take place to the outbuildings and garages. Um, so that's essentially what the application is proposed.